society. Uh, obviously, uh, most of you are familiar with the system, but uh, I'm asked to inform you anyway that you have to keep your audio muted and your video closed when you're not speaking. And you only open your video and audio, and you certainly have to open your video as well because uh, the ICT people get very jittery and harass me uh, because they have to see your face on the screen because some of these programs are cast on, uh, on the channels live and others are shown on YouTube. So basically, uh, they, they require that. So please cooperate. I'll assist in that regard when people forget. Secondly, uh, just to remind people, especially those who are new uh, to the finance committees, that uh, the 10 minutes you're given, often you feel, especially in a situation like where we are now with COVID-19 and an unprecedented supplementary budget of this nature, you often feel that you aren't given enough time, which we appreciate and understand. But we need to stress firstly that uh, all your submissions are read by an excellent team of researchers and the two chairs take responsibility for sharing between them the responsibility to read all the submissions which we do usually over the weekend after the sub uh, submissions are presented uh, to us, which means it's coming Saturday and Sunday. And when we get to the report next week, Monday and Tuesday, we'll have gone through every submission, every line. We are pleading with all of you, as we often do, as we always do, that instead of the research team summarizing your submissions in about half a page to two thirds of a page, that by Friday noon, all of you summarize your own submissions so that you capture best and perhaps even more accurately than we can what it is you want to emphasize in the report to the House. So please, Friday noon, the secretaries, Alan and Kulileko, please send out a notice today to ask the people who are submitting uh, in the oral and, and public here, uh, in the written form, uh, a summary of about, say, two thirds of a page, and we'll give at least half to two thirds of the page exactly as you have it, or close to as you have it, uh, in the report. So that said, uh, please understand also that on Friday, if I'm correct in Kuleleko, it's still at 18.00 to 21.00, am I right? Is that yes, you're right. Sir, right. Uh, yeah. uh, National Treasury will respond to all your submissions, and you'll have an opportunity to respond to them, and then they will respond to you. So we have two parts of it, on the Wednesday and the Friday. OK, so you'll have a second bite, if you like, on Friday, where you can respond to what National, National Treasury says about what you've said, and then they will respond to what you've said, and then we'll move on. So uh, having said all of that, uh, Co-Chair, do you want to say anything? Joe, are you here? Come here, Joe? No, 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 I'm OK. You can continue, Come on, Eunice. So I, I'm going to keep a uh, stopwatch. Please don't get upset with me. I, I, I didn't determine that there are 60 seconds in a minute and so on, right? It, it's really not my doing and I'm using an iPhone. And also members, please remi remind yourselves, you have up to three minutes to speak. And again, including the chairs, uh, uh, we monitor ourselves. So we're all in the same boat, in the same boat as it were. So we'll start with Kosatu's Matthew Parks, who's so familiar to us that we don't need to introduce him, know him himself, right? Matthew, over to you, my friend. I don't know why you're so happy in these COVID-19 circumstances. You <laughs> seem to be beaming there. <laughs> okay, welcome everybody, especially our uh, people from civil society. Welcome indeed, over to you. Right, okay. Matthew, you know the score, right? Yes, yes, no thanks, Comrade Chair, and uh, good morning, members. No, I'm happy, Comrade Chair, just to see wonderful members, especially yourself. Um, but I'll try to be very to the point, Chair. I think Nkureleko is going to share the presentation, if I'm correct. Otherwise, I could do it. Um, you can yes, go ahead. Yes. Please ask me that, yeah. But you can speak to it in the meanwhile, yeah. Okay, I'll speak to the meanwhile because of time pressure, Chair. Um, yeah. So, Chair, I think, look, I think our first um, concern, like anybody else, was about the, the economic challenges we're facing. Um, even before the COVID-19, we had 40% levels of unemployment and thousands being retrenched. Many of our SOEs, municipalities and departments are collapsing. Um, we all know the, the huge levels of corruption and wasteful expenditure within the state. And of course, the declining revenues, tax revenues to the state. And um, members, of course, are aware that we we're already in an economic recession before the lockdown. And we've been downgraded several times since. So, Chair, I think we had essentially hoped to hear bold plans from government 
to address this, this, these many crises. We really hope to hear one trillion rand stimulus plan. <clears throat> this is not a figure that we just uh, dreamt of one night, but it's a figure that we, the president has, the republic has mentioned several times. His argument was that if you want to deal with the, with the economic crisis, with the recession, to smash unemployment, anything less than one trillion rand to counter the GDP contraction is, is insufficient. So we didn't hear anything about that. We welcome the infrastructure program announced by the president on Tuesday last week. <clears throat> there is some reference to it in the budget, <clears throat> but there's some contradictory information, contradictory budgetary amounts and time frames. So we think it needs sufficient clarity, but we welcome it and we think that's a huge a key catalyst for change. We really hope to hear of, uh, key economic and regulatory interventions by the state. We didn't see many being mentioned, if any. Um, the job retention and creation interventions we felt were, were too few. There was very little mention of local procurement, which for us is a key way to grow the economy. We didn't hear <clears throat> of um, any plans to turn around the SOEs or any plans to deal with issues of corruption and wasteful expenditure or measures to increase revenue <clears throat> or to plug the tax loopholes. Um, we do welcome the shifting of funds to, to key departments on the front lines against COVID-19, the economy chair. Chair, on the stimulus plan, um, look, I mean, most economists would, uh, were, would estimate that for every 5% of the GDP that we suffer contraction, we'll lose about 500 billion rand. And the figures vary from a 7% GDP contraction to a 16%. And many predict that unemployment will push past 50%. We really want to see a massive stimulus plan to, to, to assuage this. <clears throat> the, the measures that the, the minister announced are those which the president announced in April. Those are economic relief measures to, to get us through the lockdown and the initial crisis, but we don't feel those are measures to grow us out of a recession, to deal with unemployment, etc. Um, Chair, we feel that any stimulus and other relief to businesses must be conditional upon them retaining workers' jobs and be incentivized through grants or reduction of loans that need to be paid back for job creation. But we do feel there's a need for much more dedicated support for badly affected sectors of the economy, like retail, hospitality, restaurants, tourism, et cetera. Some of the key interventions, Chair, we had hoped to have seen from the, from government was around fast tracking the digital economy, digital spectrum, um, further interventions to ensure a reliable and affordable electricity supply, which is a key impediment interventions to sort out metal rails, many challenges, transnet challenges, the backlogs and the problems of the ports, the delays in granting water licenses to businesses, and really a mass local procurement and buy local campaign. So we'd also hope to hear from the private sector, because government alone cannot carry the entire weight of the nation, but from the banks, plans to make affordable credit, make credit much more accessible to, to consumers. Uh, we'd hope to hear from government and the private sector cracking down on illegal lenders, from government cracking down on illicit goods, and without stating the obvious chair, measures to ensure that government pays supplies within 30 days. You know, there's long promised commitments. Chair, run the infrastructure program, and we're struggling a bit here because we get two different messages from the presidency and the public works department on the one hand, speaking to a 1.6 trillion rand infrastructure program over a few years, which for us is fantastic. It's a key intervention. We welcome the um, involvement of the private sector, bringing financial resources there, but we need a bit more clarity because the budget speaks to 100 billion rand over 10 years. We do think we need a bit more clarity about the specific areas of, in, of investment, and we think they need to prioritize ports and rail, energy, water, and so on. Chair, around the economic relief measures announced so far <clears throat> by government, we do welcome, and you might be shocked, that COSATA welcomes the Reserve Bank's interventions during the lockdown. Those are the kind of interventions we hope they will continue to do. Um, we think there's a, a need for much more sectoral support for, as I said before, the 200 billion rand surety that's been given to banks by the state, we're quite shocked and we really need to see government intervening quickly because so far only about three and a half percent has been dispersed. But I think, Chair, it can't be a blank check. It must be linked to the issue of saving and creating jobs. We noticed the minister talked about uh, insurance companies providing relief to consumers. We were quite shocked about that. Our understanding that they've only provided about 100 million rand worth of relief. Um, Chair, 
the 100 billion rand job creation uh, provision in the budget, we're not sure if that's enough. That looks to us like the existing employment tax incentive for youth employment scheme, and we're not sure if that's really going to dent unemployment given the records. Chair on social relief, um, Lucas Kosato, we have not just sat on a lot of complaining about government and the private sector. We've helped to push the UF to disperse uh, billions of rands to workers, that is workers' monies. By this morning, they've dispersed about 30 billion rand into workers' pockets with all the dramas that have come with it, but it's still gone through. It's likely to exceed 50 billion rand by the end of June payments, but there is a need to further capacitate the UF and also to extend further relief to workers who still can't go back to work. But also, Chair, we have 60 million workers in South Africa, only 11 million are registered with the UF. So there is a need for mass registration and compliance campaign to make sure all employees and employers contribute. The SASA relief measures, Chair, are welcome, but it's quite concerning that many of those uh, relief interventions by SASA have still not been paid out. For example, the 350 rand. It really is scandalous when people are, st are struggling to survive. Chairs Kosato, we made a proposal to Treasury to allow workers who have lost income to access up to six months equivalent of the lost salary from the pension funds. Uh, this should be tax free. We're disappointed that Treasury has not moved speed around it, but we are engaging with them and we hope to be meeting with them again next week to see if we can find a, a common way forward around it. But I think it might help to save workers who have lost wages at no cost to the state and help to stimulate the local economy. Chair, I won't go too much into the wage bill, but just to say, we think the COVID-19 has shown us the need for a capacitated state. We need to honor those public servants like nurses and doctors and police officers who have been risking their lives and dying in large numbers. We are simply saying government should honor the existing wage agreement. We recognize a huge fiscal pressure space in the state, but we think in the next three wage agreement, we can easily help government to save the 160 billion rand. You would know that inflation has plummeted by almost half, that alone re resolves half the issue. But we think with a, a more progressive sliding scale, it's shown that lower workers have protected from inflation and reducing what politicians, what management earn, and having a single collective bargaining process for the entire state, we can find those savings. I think, Chair, we'd also want to see the PIC helping public servants who cannot afford home or educational loans as well. <clears throat> On the SOE's Chair, we're going to sign the ESCOM Social Compact and NEDLAC in the implementation plan in the next two weeks. We think that will help mobilize uh, financial support for ESCOM and it's got a clear turnaround plan. We could be happy to give a copy of it to members. But I think, Chair, we're concerned around the other SOEs. There doesn't appear to be clear plans for the other SOEs. And now thousands of workers are facing retrenchments because of a lack of a clear plan to save these SOEs to put them on a, a sound business model and financial footing. Chair, just coming towards the end, I think I might be running out of time. Um, we do agree with the uh, Minister of Finance that we are in a serious danger with regards to the debt issue. Our debt levels are not so high right now, but the level of increase in the projected trajectory is very worrying. We're very worried about going to a debt trap because the first to suffer will be, will be workers who will be retrenched and have their wages slashed, etc. But we're worried that we don't have a credible plan. Our approach to debt payments, Chair, to reducing the debt is to grow, stimulate the economy, to grow it, that will generate the revenues needed to pay back the debt. Or would it simply reducing public servants' wages, <clears throat> implementing cuts to the state, might choke the economy? Chair, we've made a few proposals on corruption and wasteful expenditure, but we don't feel the state is really moving with sufficient determination to hold those officials, business people, politicians, etc., liable for corruption and wasteful expenditure, and they really need to start coming to the party. <clears throat> Chair, I think we do. Minutes, please, please round up. Yeah. Sure. The last last minute, Chair. We do welcome the additional shifting to, to key departments, but we're quite worried, Chair, about will they spend the money? Um, will they use that money on buying local instead of just buying imported masks from overseas, etc.? <clears throat> we are worried, Chair, that not enough money has been given to the key economic departments involved in job creation. We've made a few proposals. I know, Comrade Chair, you would ask where will we give this money. We think it's simple. Well, not simple, but there are obvious areas. The reprioritization of the public expenditure, where the government has managed to sh shift 150 billion rand alone, is quite indicative. There's further intervention needed at SARS from capacitation to loopholes to illicit goods to wealth taxes, where there are still some options left. 
Chair, we do welcome and support governments of uh, international financial loans, but of course, with some concerns that we mustn't raise and get over indebted, especially with the Rand dollar exchange rate. We think there is a need for the DFIs to come and prioritize job creation, economic growth, and infrastructure, and when they invest. <clears throat> Chair, if we can just simply reduce corruption and wasteful expenditure from the 150 billion rand currently, that alone can, can free up huge resources. Then the last point, Chair, is about fast track and impact investment engagements with the private sector under Regulation 28, because that really is what is needed to drive the investment and the recovery of the economy. So let me stop there, Chair. Thanks yeah, very much. Thank you. 11 minutes, right. Next is uh, the C19 People Coalition. Are you here? Kululeko, are they here? Anybody from the organization? We, yes, we're yes, here. Yes, sir. Okay, can you go for it, whoever it is? Yeah, you've got 10 minutes, thanks. Right, who's speaking on your behalf? We have two presenters. It's myself, Natasha yeah. Valley, as well as Shayura Kala. We have a presentation. Shayura, do you want to share your screen? I In Kululeko, what's happening? Oh, they are busy sharing their presentation on their slide chair. Oh, they're managing it. All right, can one of them continue and start speaking, please? Sure. Natasha, I'll Kaira. Get... Yeah. yeah. Sure. So I'll get started. Good. Um. The state's announcement that they would provide a caregiver grant and create a new COVID-19 social relief of distress grant of 350 rand, of course, provided some relief. But um, as the last speaker already said, our worst fears around the failure to implement have been realized. We want to make it very clear that this is a global disaster and the decisions we make about social relief are decisions uh, about life and death. We should not need to convince you that balancing spreadsheets um, should be valued over life. Instead, we're going to discuss recommendations based on engagement with grant claimants and organizations that represent them. Um, we, we provided uh, several recommendations uh, in our submission, but we're not going to focus on each of them, uh, but we've explored them in more detail elsewhere. Uh, for now, we're going to proceed by highlighting the promises the budget reneged on, examples of spending on social relief across the world, and the unprecedented humanitarian crisis we find ourselves in if we fail to, um, I mean, if we fail to implement effective social relief measures. Um, some say the only antidote to a lack of economic growth is economic growth, but we know from empirical evidence that economic growth does not necessarily translate uh, to inclusive economic development. There's no time machine to take us back, and even if there were, things are bad enough. We must let this moment challenge us to shift our energies towards the creation of a new economic system with a more human face. So we want to start with the urgent problem we must now address. Uh, government says there's going to be big job losses, but what cover do people have? SASA rejects deserving applicants and national treasury slashes, slashes funding. Um, we want to take up the point that there's been a low, supposed low uptake of grants, and this has been used to justify the cuts, um, uh, implying that there's less of a need than the government initially antes anticipated. But celebrating this low uptake of grants as fiscal savings ignores the structural barriers to accessing the grant, exacerbated by the conditionalities for application. According to their latest report, SASA has only accepted 3.2 million applicants out of at least 10 million, but up to 15 million eligible. Worse, it has only paid out a third of those accepted. Some who applied in April have still not received feedback. We're losing you, Natasha. Hello, are you back? Yeah. Okay, we can yes. hear you now, I think. Okay, okay. so um, SASA has only accepted 3.2 million applicants out of at least 10 million um, eligible, possibly 15 million eligible. It's only paid out a third of those accepted. Some who applied in April have still not received any feedback on the status of their applications. Um, so the idea that there's a low uptake is clearly not the case. Instead, there are systematic issues with how the COVID grant has been rolled out as a result of application criteria that excludes some of the most precarious, poor communication, reliance on technologies to which many do not have access, 
exclusionary verification conditions, and slow payment systems on the part of SASA. It's also prudent to note that 90% um, of those who were promised the grant have instead had no income for a third month running. In clinical, can you help there? Because Natasha is not clear. Hi, Jeff. Natasha? Yes. Can you I hear me? Yes, I can. <laughs> Shaira, Shaira, I think yes. I with your computer. Can you take over? Please? Just count here, Natasha. Am I right in Kulileko? It's not just me, it's all of us, right? Yes, no, she's not right. No, no um, I can hear Natasha perfectly, actually. Yeah, I can hear her perfectly. Oh. Right, now we can she see. She was audible to me, too. Are you okay, able fine. to see the screen? All right, no, no, go ahead, go ahead. Fine. Yes, we can, we can receive the screen. Okay, thank you. Okay, because I think it's quite important that all of this comes through. So if people aren't able to hear me, maybe Shaira should take over. No, we can hear you now, certainly. Okay. Okay. Okay, so um, we're, okay, moving on. Um, the choices made now must reflect an intersectional gender responsive budgeting process rather than regressive budgeting, which violates constitutional and international obligations of non-regression and maximum available resources in relation to the realization of socioeconomic uh, we, rights. We, 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 we manage that, sir. We manage that. But now... Natasha, can you put your screen on, please? Can you put uh, your video on, Natasha, for the reasons that is recorded uh, by the ICT people? The, if, if I put my screen on, then we'll okay. lose the presentation. All right, fine, fine, go ahead. It's not me. I'm sorry about this. It's not me. I find all this quite frustrating, but they insist on it. I don't think it's important. We need to see what's there on the screen and hear you. Yes, good, fine. Go ahead, go ahead, please. Okay. Um, and this is an important point. Uh, there was the exclusion of caregivers in the COVID grant and not topping up the child support grant per child, but rather per caregiver, negatively uh, affects women. And this needs to be addressed urgently. We've also seen that with the closure of schools, 9 million children who depend on school feeding schemes were negatively affected. Um, Shaira and I um, respectively work in food security schemes and as teachers. And we've specifically seen hunger rise rapidly. People are de desperate and destitute with evictions also going ahead despite the lockdown. So I want to, when we moved on to uh, recommendation two on the slide, but I do want to just mention our first recommendation briefly, which was that we require clear and consistent communication. So like I said earlier, even when applications are approved, sometimes the applicant doesn't receive a verification code. Um, furthermore, details around back pay remain unclear. Will SASA ensure that all those elig eligible and verified will receive the full six months worth of grant payments? A new appeals process has been created, but this process is ironically still an online one. Um, millions have been relying on the promise of this grant for survival and with such high numbers of rejection, if one were to appeal and get the grant, would one be eligible for back pay? Um, all of these questions still remain unanswered. I want to take us through this graph. I hope you can see it. Um, so again, the exclu exclusion of caregivers and migrants and the unclear exclusion of having an income, which affects, which affects informal workers from the grant, has also been questioned. The Pretoria High Court has ordered that the COVID-19 grant be extended to asylum seekers, as well as to special permit holders. Sadly, this progress means little when we look at the sheer failure of SASA to implement the payment of these grants um, and the lack of funds allocated to meet the now increased demands. So in this graph, hopefully if you can see it. If you can't, it's fine. I'll just explain to you that um, if we one would it. have the care, caregiver top-up grant um, of of 500 Rand, and then other grants also get a top-up of 250, mm -hmm. along with the COVID grant of 350 Rand, including the caregivers, um, then it significantly improves um, people's livelihood um, and, uh, uh, and decreases the number of people living in extreme poverty. Um, Shaira, do you want to take over? 
Yes, thank you so much, Natasha, um, and thank you, Chair. Um, the recommendation uh, number three is to address the massive shortfall in funding uh, to, in essence, pay the grants. Um, we know the figures. Um, we know that uh, 50 billion was announced initially, and yet only 41 billion has been allocated. Natasha has covered why that is problematic. Uh, we also note that 17 billion rand was promised by President Cyril Ramaphosa for the special COVID-19 social relief of distress grant, but SASA is claiming that they have only received 3.5 billion. Um, now, we don't know exactly where the problems lie, but this seems like a huge challenge and we need to address it and put our heads together. Um, uh, if I can go to the next slide. We've looked at um, international best practice around this and we've followed evidence-based policy um, in health. Uh, why are we ignoring the evidence when it comes to economics? As you can see here, a once-off cash transfer in the U.S. increased spending, especially amongst lower-income households. And that, as Natasha has explained, also uh, hugely improves people lives, people's livelihoods. So it's not just a, uh, an improvement to people's livelihoods, but it also improves aggregate demand. And then if we can look at, um, you know, going forward, a commitment to a basic income guarantee for all. Uh, we understand that there's chronic unemployment in South Africa. We want to highlight um, as the cash transfer subgroup uh, within the C19 People's Coalition that the idea that there is a deserving poor is a myth, given that we are in the most unequal country in the world. We also need to prioritize a framework for redistributive justice. And um, if we look at uh, countries in uh, across the world, in India, for example, they've looked at inclusive growth dividends, which are pegged at 1% of GDP. Uh, by putting more money in the hands of the poor, these uh, mechanisms could help reverse the pattern and provide a bottom-up boost to the economy. Not only will this increase income, but it also provides predictability of future income and is a key driver for demand. So recent evidence in Kenya also shows that um, Income transfers can have a multiplier effect of 2.7. More generally, both theory and evidence suggests that broader consumption uh, increases and promotes inc inclusive development. Um, this also allows firms to recover um, and for more investment um, in productive capital and technology. Um, thus, while the government might be wary of making additional fis fiscal commitments at a time of Shara, sorry, you're at 11 minutes, but because of the interruptions, I'll allow a bit of latitude. Remember, this submission of yours will be taken very seriously over the next five days, beyond sure. what you say. But if you can round we up just, in the next minute. We just have two slides left, so I'll be rounding up. Great. Thank you so All much. All right, right ahead. Yeah, sure. Um, we want to also make note of the fact that um, SASA has stated that if they detect a recipient is receiving money into their bank account, regardless of the context, Perhaps someone has taken out a loan or is receiving a small donation from a family member, the said recipient will no longer receive the grant. And we think this is irrational. Given that the 350 Rand is inadequate on its own, excluding recipients on these petty grants cannot be justified. Um, if I can go to the second last slide, we really believe that we need to move towards a new economy and to Things that are key here, which we've recommended in the in the document we submitted, is the um, fix the patent laws campaign, where pharmaceutical companies are set to profit from this crisis. Our collective responsibility, so that we can free up funding for social grants and other responsibilities, must be to ensure that we can afford vaccines. Many countries have incorporated public health safeguards into national law, and we we believe we need to do the same. Lastly. There's no recovery without systemic change. If this pandemic has not made us rethink the false economic assumption that there is to be a trade-off between welfare programs and efficiency, I really don't know what will. When we are one of the most unequal countries in the world, there can be no such trade-off. We cannot afford to not afford a well-designed social protection architecture. And this isn't charity. Rather, it's a key engine for inclusive economic and therefore must be a priority of Treasury. 
The South African government has reneged on its promise to assist those who have been further pushed into hunger and destitution due to the lockdown. And there's no way to justify this. Right. We must pay the price. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Look, I'm sorry, really. Uh, I hate being a policeman. Uh, it's just that we have to manage this process. Let me once again assure you that we will give concerted attention to your submission. We're going to look at it carefully, both your written, uh, this one, and if you have a longer version, which was sent to us late last night or early this morning. But we will give full attention in the next five days to this. Thank you. A lot of your issues, by the way, fall more on the appropriations than the fiscal framework, but be that as it may, it's one parliament and we'll manage that. Uh, let's move on then to the Institute of Accountability uh, uh, of Southern Africa. I think this is Mr. Hoffman, who's uh, not a new hand to this committee, so you can manage in 10 minutes. I'm sure I can manage in fewer minutes. Thank you, Honorable Chair, and good, good morning to members. Am, am I coming through loud and clear? Very much so. Oh, good. I'm not uh, going to rely on any uh, aids because I think that they seem to make more trouble than they're worth. Um, th there are only two points that we wish to raise with the committee because as we see it, the um, supplementary budget makes it very clear that 21 cents in every rand is going to be spent on servicing the country's debt and 62 cents in every rand is going to be spent on the wages of the public service. So really, it's it's just the change that we we have when you've added those two numbers together that um, is 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 available for a discretionary spend. And we we take the view that the pandemic has had a severe impact on the levels of poverty in the country. We have lived with poverty for half of the population uh, since time immemorial and certainly throughout the democratic era. But uh, what we you, so sorry about that. Uh, Shaira or Natasha, can you kindly take your, 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 what's it called, presentation, your slide presentation off the screen, please? Because we're done with it, right? So one of you has to do that. Uh, Natasha, can you handle that? Chaira seems to be on the phone, I think. <laughs> and, uh, so I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, no problem at all. Um, the, the inclusion of the poor in the, the system uh, has, has hitherto been uh, done via SASA with a very complex and difficult to manage uh, grant system. The, the, the two points that we want to, to, to raise with this committee are firstly to draw attention to the fact that hunger in the land is sure to increase because of the bloodbath on the jobs front that uh, we, we can see coming our way in the, um, in in uh, the uh, the wake of the lockdown and of the ravages of the virus. So what we need to really bring to the attention of Parliament as a whole, and this committee in particular, is that many of the people who are going to be plunged into poverty are not people who are used to living in poverty. They are people who have been in jobs for a long time and are used to being part of the system rather than being the, the marginalized, the uh, chronically uh, deprived. And this is going to have an effect on the levels of hunger and destitution in the land. So hunger and destitution are really the, the two points that we want to make in our uh, time available. On the hunger front, we have drawn attention in our written presentation, which is uh, neatly collected on our website under alleviating hunger, to the fact that 30% of the food produced in South Africa currently goes to waste. Now, uh, allowing the, the, the country to throw away 30% of the good food that is produced uh, by the farmers, by the canners, by the bakers, 
by the whole food production process in the country is scandalous and cannot be allowed to continue in circumstances in which the uh, incidence of hunger uh, in, 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 in adults and of malnutrition in children is, is clearly going to increase if we are to believe what the uh, medical people are telling us in South Africa and what the UN General Secretary is saying um, in, 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 in the world. We want to draw it to the attention of Parliament that it is possible to recover food that is surplus to the needs of the uh, retail and wholesale food chain and to make it available to people who are living in poverty and who are hungry. And we, we, we cannot ignore this. We cannot leave it to philanthropy and the private sector to, uh, to, to, to make a plan. There are food banks in South Africa, but I'm, under, I'm, I'm given to understand that when I uh, submitted in the written submission that only 10% of the 30% uh, of food that goes to waste is actually recovered by those working already in that sector, that is an overestimation of the amount of, of uh, food that is actually recovered in the system. And we, we, we su suggest that public money needs to be put into the uh, recovery of food that would otherwise end up on a landfill site. We've drawn attention to the uh, business model of the uh, food banking that is done by um, Food Forward SA. There are other um, entities in the field. We think that a, a suitably chosen uh, uh, Department of State should be put in charge of calling for tenders on the recovery of food. The, the system that is in place is able to deliver a plate of food at a cost of 85 cents to the system, not to the person getting the plate of food. And, and th that needs to be taken to scale because poverty is, uh, is, is uh, exacerbated by the, uh, the COVID disaster and because the, um, the, the, the incidence of malnutrition in the land, which is a very terrible long-term project, um, uh, is, it, it, it's a, a problem that locks people into poverty for all time. So let's at least not waste what we've already got. The other point that uh, the second, so uh, alleviating hunger is, is, is our uh, uh, original main point. Uh, the other point, which has already been covered from uh, my colleagues from uh, C19, is the question of a basic income grant. And I don't want to uh, take up too much time on, on the, of, of the committee because you, you have heard C19 already. All that I want to say is that when we are budgeting and when we are working out how to cut the cloth appropriately because of the setbacks to the economy that the pandemic has caused, let us not forget that there is a great deal of public money that has been looted in the not so distant past that is recoverable if the political will to do so can be mustered. We have in the 13th paragraph of our written submission uh, listed uh, various sources of uh, that money. We draw attention to the fact that uh, Judge Zondo and in his commission has been bewailing the fact that no steps are being taken to recover the loot of state capture. And it can be done. It can be done through the Criminal Justice Administration. It can be done through the Assets Forfeiture Unit. And it can be done 
by way of civil recovery of looted funds. All of the loot that moved out of the country is traceable in the modern banking system and all that is required to recover it or at least to freeze it pending recovery is the political will to give the instruction to debt collection agencies to do the necessary. The uh, experience in the field is so that I'm once at nine minutes, right? But fine. I'm, I'm fine. I'm on my last point. So that's fine. It's, uh, in fact, I won't even use all 10. The experience in the field is that when a civil freezing order is obtained against a looter who has squirreled the money away in Hong Kong or Dubai or London or Switzerland or wherever, when that freezing order is obtained and the money is frozen in the bank, the looter sees that he doesn't have a, a, a defense to the freezing and walks away from the money that has been traced through the banking system. That is low-hanging fruit that is waiting for a suitably motivated uh, country to collect and to use to reduce poverty in the land. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, indeed. Uh, Auta is next. Uh, uh, in Kuleleko, are they here, Auta? Auta. Auta. I'm here, Chair. Uh, you're an old hand too, so you know, 10 minutes is fine for you. You can okay. do it. Thank, thank you. you, Chair. I appreciate the opportunity, Chair, and good morning to all the members as well, to everyone else presenting. Um, thanks, Nguledek. If I can run through the presentation with you, that'd be great. Um, if we could just jump to the overview, which is slide three. So, Chair, I'll just start talking. Um, we we really structured our our submission um, in five sections or segments. Um, the first being economic outlook, uh, the second zero-based budgeting, the third revised fiscal framework, fourth uh, compensation in the public sector, and lastly local government finance. And we did this with some assistance from the Public Affairs Research Institute. So the the drastic impact we believe, Chairperson. And members really demands a drastic fiscal and economic response. Um, we do believe that there are serious Paul changes Hoff that. Paul Hoffman, you were looking for me. We moved. We moved our time till nine o'clock on. Uh, Sorry, Friday. Mr. Hoffman. Mr. Hoffman. Now, now, Mr. Hoffman, you got your audio on. Can you switch it off, please? Thanks, Chair. Right. Go ahead. Um, Sorry. So, so we really think that there has to be a, a serious structural adjustment. Um, we do understand that this is a initial response and the minister has indicated that more serious response will come in October when it comes to the MTBPS. And we look forward to that, Chairperson. We want to, we want to preempt some of those more drastic measures and suggest some of our own. So the, the main problem is really the increasing budget deficit. And as previous speakers has mentioned, um, just approaching a debt crisis and the fact that our tax revenue is contracting. So we, we really feel that there is a need to prune state expenditure, but in a very particular way, Chairperson, that would minimally impact on people's daily lives. Next slide, please. So looking at the economic outlook, Chair, it's, it is quite bleak. Um, I think it's worth noting that even before lockdown was implemented, that the economy was performing negatively. And I want to refer to the three phase response that that National Treasury has outlined, which starts with preservation, recovery, and then pivoting. And we believe that we should move to pivoting immediately. Chairperson, we, we question what it is we're trying to preserve if the economy was performing negatively to start with. However, we do understand the urgency and, and the importance of, of emergency spending at the moment. We, we think a key step that needs to be taken is long-term partnerships with domestic and international private sector groups for access to financial capital, alternative sources of revenue, or good debt. And we also believe that there has to be much more concerted efforts in government to partner with civil society and with academia to really tap into those resources as well. 
we we're going to get to state state owned enterprises chair in its own slide but just to say that we think that the savings that can be made there if these are rationalized if some of them are abandoned which are no longer um, relevant or, or affordable that money can be injected into smmes and township economies as capital expenditure next slide please we then get to zero based budgeting chair which we are very optimistic about we don't really see that in in the current adjustment and as I said, we really look forward to that coming through later in the year. But we think that it's an essential step um, and it's essential that members of these committees also adopt this attitude to, to say that we need to relook at the ordinary expenses that have come through year by year. They have not changed significantly um, in recent years, despite significant issues taking place in, in the public sector and in government. We also think that the Competition Commission should take a much stronger stance, that its recommendations should be implemented as soon as possible, for example, when it comes to PRASA and its unbundling. <coughs> and Chair, we, we also think that it has to entail a qualitative analysis of what certain spending programs have achieved, and if they haven't achieved their objectives, they should be reviewed or eliminated entirely, as opposed to simply looking at underspending or overspending. We, we really recommend Chair, that these committees ask for National Treasury and in, in cooperation with the Auditor General's Office to table a human resources report and a strategic plan to, to really make sure that those posts that are filled in government are really effective and efficient and that those that are redundant or have been ineffective should be eliminated. Next slide, please. Um, we then get to the revised fiscal framework chair, which I think is the most relevant for these committees <clears throat> for the time being. And the point is really that the public purse is very much overstretched. Um, we are quite shocked to see that spending will increase over the short term, at least, regardless of, of cuts that have been made to the wage bill, or at least capping of its growth. And we think that this current plan to to really cap the budget deficit to really cap the debt to GDP ratio by 2023 is not strong enough. Um, we don't believe that that's going to be a very good avenue. We think that that should happen much sooner and that we may want to cap the debt to GDP ratio a little bit lower than 87%. We very much agree with with Treasury's sentiment that business as usual is no longer possible. We believe that um, debt servicing costs will crowd out all social expenses, which as it stands, which I think it's worth noting that millions of people do benefit from social grants, even though they might be bigger, but it's something that needs to be preserved. And we do believe that if serious measures aren't taken at the macroeconomic level, that these will be unsustainable. And that's a serious concern for many people. We really think that um, there needs to be a serious reprioritization, Chairperson. Um, we don't see that as of yet. Um, marginal decreases to departmental budgets have been made. But we think that those, those need to be much more drastic. Next slide, please. Getting to taxation, Chair, so we understand and we've been saying over past years that we cannot increase rates of taxation much more um, Direct taxation is quite high already. We think that there is space for alternative taxes, such as a wealth tax, um, such as a digital tax on major ICT firms, uh, medium and large firms that really profit from South African discourse and they influence discourse, but they don't really materially contribute to society. And I think overall, Chair, we we recommending that measures are taken to stimulate growth. Um, which will really increase indirect taxation instead of direct taxation. Next slide, please. So just to really give ourselves a, a reminder of the seriousness of the situation we are in, um, whilst many people's lives are in danger as a result of this virus, we are in danger as a country over the long term, um, looking at these numbers. Um, also looking at the Auditor General's recent findings, that local government finances are deteriorating further. Um, Chair, we note that additional funds are being channeled through municipalities 
to provide relief. And I think this really needs to be scrutinized very carefully. We want to see um, more civil oversight in how money is spent in municipalities. And I think the Auditor General holds the same view. We, we really think that the new Auditor General who's going to come in needs to be carefully selected, Chairperson. I think that's very critical. Next slide, please. So, again, Chair, we need to reprioritize expenditure. Um, a lot of money is being taken away from infrastructure budgets. Um, might only be for the short term, but this is a pattern that we've seen over the past 10 years, that not enough money is allocated to capital expenditure and that we really spent too much on, on current items, um, such as remuneration and compensation, which just is not sustainable. We really have a need for improved infrastructure in schools, in terms of roads, especially in rural provinces, and in the health system. Um, not only short-term expenditure, but also long-term. Um, you have nine, minute, nine minutes, but OK, some latitude. Thanks, Chairperson. Thank you. Um, I'll jump to the next slide then. The state-owned entities, Chair, the National Planning Commission recently published a position paper on how these should be restructured, and by and large, we very much agree with that. Various forms of um, restructuring and reform that really need to happen urgently. Next slide, please. Um, getting to compensation, we strongly recommend a rationalization of the cumulative cost of remuneration in the public service. We suggest that this committee facilitates engagements between the Auditor General, DPME, civil society, and strategic financial oversight entities such as the Financial Intelligence Center to really make sure that COVID-19 spending is scrutinized more carefully, but also that this can become an experimental norm. Finally, in local government chair, um, we believe that this is the sector that requires the most urgent and drastic structural reforms. We do not believe that municipalities, many of them, in fact, most of them, are financially sustainable in their current form and they need to change fundamentally. Um, we did this analysis with the help of the Public Affairs Research Institute, and they very much hold the same view, Chair, and they also suggested that those measures that are available under Section 139 of the Constitution are not used adequately and that they can be used much more forcefully. Thank you, Chairperson. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you all of you for cooperation. Also, to let you know, if you don't, that Parliament has a limited bandwidth, obviously. So committees are only allowed to meet for three hours. We have to finish at 12. Those of us on the NCOP side, we have a sitting of the House right now. But we've been allowed some latitude till about 12.15, and if we push it to 12.30. But obviously, the main thing is for us to read your submissions, come to terms with it, and decide on what we think of it. So having said that, can we hand over now to members, please? Uh, everybody uh, who wants to ask questions, can you signal in the chat group and or let in Kululeko know or, or let me know? So who's first? And up to three minutes. I see nobody in the chat side saying they want to speak. So, is there nobody who's got anything to ask? I've got Ms. Uh, Dr. Dion George. Sure. Dion, go ahead, Dion. Thank you. Three minutes, thanks. Thanks very much, Chairperson. Thanks for the presentations. I want to ask Kosatu, um, on your pension um, submission with regards to pension funds, we know that a lot of pension fund members are having a lot of difficulty and have wanted access in some way to their funds. Um, the government doesn't seem very amenable to this. What is your position regarding expanding pension-backed loans um, beyond just for housing? So, for example, allowing members to have access to a perhaps a loan or a soft loan that they would maybe repay on a deferred basis, etc. But it would allow them right now to some support from their own pension money. So I'd like to have your view on that, please. I'd also like to know whether you have a view on whether there should be some kind of um, immediate tax relief on um, uh, workers who are now who are forced to work from home and therefore, um, well, actually aren't able to claim for a home office at the moment because they don't meet the criteria. So whether those criteria for working from home should be relaxed to provide support to working people who are unable um, to actually go to work. Um, thanks very much, Chair. 
I think Willie's next, am I right? And then it's Dennis, and then it's Kosana. Right. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, uh, Chair, thank you. Jack. To, thank you to all the people that made presentations. My question is to Kusatu. Uh, you are representing the employees of this country, uh, but I don't think that you really represent a lot of employees that's in the farming and agricultural sector. We are talking a lot about the fact that the unemployment figures will rise. Have you made any calculations of the amount of work losses that will be in the agricultural sector, firstly due to the drought and secondly due to COVID as well? Uh, and what do you think should happen in that regard to uh, stop the growth of unemployment in that specific sector? Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, after that is Dennis, Kozana and Injadu. Thank you, uh, Chair, very, very much. And yeah, thanks for the presentations. I think lots of interesting info coming out of them and, and, and plenty of, of uh, food for thought, as they say. Um, I really want to just chat to Arta and maybe get a little bit more input from them uh, on their position. They spoke about underspending and performance uh, and how historically it's been rewarded. Um, and the fact that certain of those projects that have shown to be redundant need to be eliminated. I'd, I'd like them to expand a little bit on that and, and, and give us some more information. It kind of ties in quite a lot with my thinking that, you know, if something's not working, if, if a department's not prioritizing it, it's certainly uh, we, we, we should work out whether the department has got the political will to drive it forward and whether it should be funded going forward. Um, I'm, I'm also interested in, 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 in the, the, the situation around municipalities. Um, and and I, I think maybe the outer's view might be very metrocentric, if I can call it that. Because, frankly, if you call a – they're calling for civil oversight over municipal spending. And the fact is, if you call a financial meeting in the majority of municipalities, and certainly rural municipalities around the country – uh, you might get one or two people that pitch up, um, and the reasons for them pitching up is generally because they have a water leak or something like that. So, so having been in local government, when you, when you do try and elicit public inputs or, or facilitate civil oversight over municipal spending, um, it becomes incredibly difficult because people don't have the time or the patience to deal with it. Um, and I'd like to hear the ideas of how best to improve perhaps that public participation in the financial uh, running of municipalities um, going forward, because what what we're doing uh, doesn't really work. It's easy to say, change it, but let's hear some ideas, please. Thank you, Chair. Congress Kozana. We can't hear you. Can you unmute yourself, please? Congress Kozana, can you unmute, please? Oh dear. In Kululeku, can you help him? In the meanwhile, in Jadu, can you go for it? In Jadu? Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, thank you very much, Chairperson. Chairperson, uh, to Kosatu, uh, to welcome the presentation of Kosatu. And uh, also, to, it's, 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 I'm glad to hear that uh, Kosatu is happy with the UIF. The feedback on the UIF, uh, the progress of the UIF, and uh, also the, the pension fund uh, wage law. It's also it's a progressive uh, a proposal. My question to Kosa on what what is Kosa's position now currently agreement? Uh, in terms of government. Just to understand what is status latest uh, uh, on the pay the grants, I think it, it will be necessary to have more detail on recommendation three of of, of pay the grants, specific to 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 for and also for us uh, on the matters that was raised by uh, on on. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Comrades Kozana, you can come back on. Oh, he's on the phone, I see. All right, uh, who's next? Is anybody else? Comrades Kozana? Are you now ready? 
All right, uh, Nkolileko, can you help Comrade uh, Member Skozana to, to, to connect with us, right? Are you there, Mr. Skozana? We can't hear him, I'm afraid. Can anybody else hear him? I can't. Anybody else hear him? No, nothing coming through, Drew. No, I can't hear him. Nkolileko, what have you to say? No, no, we can't hear Mr. Skosana. Alan is busy helping him. Okay, we'll we'll give him a chance. It's beyond his control, presumably. All right, then in that case, uh, is there anybody else che who wants to speak? Yeah? Yeah, Chepesin. Is that uh, Comrade Nkiva? Yeah, go ahead. No, thank you very much, Chepesin. Let me also start off by welcoming the presentations. Uh, even though I did not uh, get to hear Kosato's presentation, uh, I only managed to connect at a time when Treasury was presenting and I only got second half of that. So I will focus on what I have heard, particularly on the Treasury. Chairperson, I am Sorry, advising... what you... Sorry who's... Treasury didn't make any submission today. Who are you referring Sorry. to? Sorry, let me... Because... Are you uh... referring to the, the people who made a presentation after Kosatu? Yeah. Ah, yeah, that's C19. They're an NGO. Yeah, okay. Okay, Chairperson, what, what I wanted to say is is that uh, my 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 issue here is that uh, of course this is a supplementary budget that we are talking about, but my main concern where I'm sitting is the issue of the social relief and uh, particularly the 350 which um, has been put forward for the people who are unemployed. Now. What I want to raise most importantly is the fact that um, the, the issue of the departments not, not working together to ensure that the, the monies reach the intended destination on time. So I, I had thought that we, we were going to have uh, someone from Treasury to present, so I would have addressed that matter uh, uh, directly to them. But perhaps let me leave it at that and then focus on this one. That I, I, I would like to suggest, Chair, that uh, one of the things that we, we ought to do is perhaps to invite an organization like Contralesa to also present in these meetings in order to ensure that we lift issues that are coming directly from rural communities. Because uh, as, I, as I listen to the majority of the presenters, it's more of a focused attention in urban and peri-urban areas and the view of the uh, the toiling masses in the rural communities is not coming sharply uh, when 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 these uh, formations are, are presenting to us so i just wanted to say that uh, in future perhaps we should uh, invite contra lesa um, amongst others uh, to present to us thank you chair all right, uh, uh, we have a request from Comrade Moletsane and then Skozana. Are, are you ready then, my friend? He's unmuted himself. Can you go for it, Comrade Skozana? Where are you? All right, we'll come back to you. In any case, look, we've got uh, Moletsane interested in asking something. Are you? Yeah, Skozana, are you on now? No, I'm afraid we still can't hear you. So can you put your question there in the chat group, please? I'm sorry, we can't hear you. I know it's beyond your control. But we'll try to help you. Alan, you're still trying to help, right? We can't hear you, yeah. Yeah, okay, in that case, uh, there is a question I'm talking about. I don't see it on the screen here, on my screen anyway. Uh, but there's a question put here. Uh, it says, oh no, there's somebody else. Uh, right now, uh, 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 can I can I actually move on to the next person, Valitsane? Yes. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Let me join colleagues to appreciate the presentation that has been done. My <clears throat> comment is on the on the on to to the Kosato. Uh, Kosato is a trade union. You know, it's looking after the affairs yeah. of the of the workers. And when looking at this uh, 350 of unemployment to to to, to those people uh, that they are getting presently because of the due to COVID 19, 
One was expecting that uh, because Kosab yeah. is looking after the affairs of the workers, they will even be interested into the into their affairs, even if after they've been retrenched, because a lot of their workers are losing their work because of the COVID-19. So one was expecting that they will stress on that to say that even the 350 must go beyond the, the COVID-19, because those are their members, they, they, are, they, they are looking after them while they are still workers. What about when, after they have been uh, retrenched? So I yeah. just want to find out uh, from them whether they not why not stressing that this 350 must go beyond that uh, COVID-19 so that they must be able to make a living and use that 350 maybe to start looking for a work again? Thank you very much. Okay, is Comrade Kozano back? No, all right. Uh, so, so if not, yeah, are you back? Oh, no, I don't, I don't think he's back. So, he's not back yet. I've asked him to type his question on the chat. So as soon as it comes through, I'll alert you. Before I, I, I Comrade Joe, do you want to ask or put any questions now, or will you do it at the end, or how? Because some of the people in this cluster might exit now when we move on to the second half of the hearing. So, do you want to raise any questions, Comrade Joe? Joe, are you around? Chair Koche is not around, is he? No, 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 no. You can proceed, no question for now. Okay, good. So then in that case, can I make a few observations very quickly? I've also got three minutes. Civil society, you can also monitor me in fairness and uh, in Kulilek will you monitor me, right? So firstly, I just want to say uh, what I, I in a vague way said last week, which is that, you know, I don't think any of us should be dogmatic, really. I really think all of us, starting with the minister and treasury, needs to be more modest. None of us you know, knows what's going to happen an hour from now, let alone in October this year when we do the adjustments budget again. So we need to be very modest and very uh, conciliatory, and we need to adopt a more give and take approach, honestly. Uh, uh, we've never had this. It's unprecedented, it's volatile, it's, it's unheard uh, of, we have no guidebook, uh, it's so unpredictable. None of us, the world's greatest scientists or the world's greatest economists and the world's greatest politicians, we can't be sure about exactly what to do. So let us all work in a spirit of give and take. Secondly, I'm at 56 seconds. Secondly, I want to say for myself, and I think the majority in this committee will probably agree, that broadly I agree with the values of all the submissions made. That isn't the issue. What underlies what you're saying is correct. But it's about what's doable that's at issue. In particular, I want to draw attention to C19 coalition is new to us. That there's very little I disagree with you in terms of the underlying values, or Kosatu for that matter. But it's about what's doable. What are the trade-offs? Where are the sources of funding? What can we do and what can't we do? In principle, most of the things COSATO and C19 say, I agree with. But, you know, and you're right to raise them. And you are in civil society and we politicians. And so we have different but complementary roles. So I, I just want to say, look, you know, I have no quibble with anything COSATO. Well, most things COSATO says and almost everything C19 says. But there are things that we may not be able to agree to because it's beyond our control as we see it anyway. So I also think we should avoid this unnecessary polarization between civil society, government, labor, business, and also between political parties. I think we'll be careful because there's a social explosion looming. If we think the spike in, 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 in uptake in, in, in infections is anything that's uh, overcoming us, what's to happen even after COVID-19? I think what we've got now is, a, is really a picnic compared to what's looming for us. And that ex social explosion will largely take a racial form, as we all know, because of the highly racialized nature of our income and class inequalities. And I think we need to work together like never before. On the issue of Contralesa, Zolani and Kiva, you know, Contralesa has the same rights as everybody else. They chose not to make presentations, but uh, you can also mobilize them next time around. Secondly, it's not just Contralesa, needless to say, in my view, that represents people in traditional communities. So do the organizations, NGOs, and other community organizations that also speak for uh, constituencies. I'm at three minutes. One final thing now, I speak as a chair. So I'm done with my...
contribution as an ordinary member, so I can switch my thing off. I took an extra 11 seconds. But now speaking as a chair, Sacha from C19 asks in the column there, rightly so, it's a question, Sacha and C19, you're new to us, the others are all old hats. Uh, and talking about old hats, and talking about Contra Lesa not being here, and the need for more representativity, uh, Comrade Co-Chair, I just want to draw an attention. If you look at all the eight or nine submissions we've received, Chairperson, uh, obviously South Africa belongs to everybody, from the extreme right to the extreme left. I'm speaking as a chair now, so I don't need to have that three minutes uh, monitoring, but I need to say this. But if you look at the participants, Comrade Chair, something that is striking, while they represent constituencies, uh, uh, you know, or, or claim to represent constituencies of the poorer people of our country, the demographic representation is, is, is very interesting across gender and racial lines. Uh, and we need organizations to be more representative, especially if they say uh, 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 that, you know, they're representing the poor. And in that sense, Contralesa has, uh, you know, at least Zolan and Kiva, Kosti and Kiva has something useful to say, which is not to say that Joe Slovo or Jeremy Cronin are not acceptable uh, or less acceptable than anybody else uh, who claims to represent the poor. So let's get that clear. Yeah. Parliament belongs to everybody. But at the same time, it is striking 26 years later about the lack of representation, in uh, representativity at least, in those who make submissions, yeah. Comrade Coach. Members, we need to think about that sort of thing as well. Uh, finally, uh, I want to say, uh, yes, Sacha, you're right. The time is very limited. We've been preoccupied this with this with this for the last four or five years. We made certain amendments, but please understand, firstly, that uh, this is an ongoing process. On Friday, from 18:00 to 21:00, we'll continue this process. Secondly, you can make further submissions up till Friday at 12 o'clock, but we'll extend it till Sunday at 12 o'clock. So, if you want to consult further with your constituencies, uh, I don't know who C19 represents, but perhaps you can say something about that in your reply. Who are you exactly? I know you from the media, but who do you represent? Uh, uh, you're not to represent anybody if you're an NGO, but since you have constituencies, maybe you want to tell us. So my question to you is C19, uh, who are you constituted of? Then I, I want to say also such a and C19. Uh, this is merely a, a first adjustment budget. Uh, we're preparing now for the second adjustment budget that happens in October. And uh, thirdly, we also have the appropriations public hearings coming up. Your issues fall more, not under fiscal framework, but more under appropriations. We will refer your submission also to them, and you can apply to make further submissions to them in about, I think, 10 days' time. Uh, the media and in Kulileko, can you also tell Lubabalo to let them know? Thank you. Over then to people who are responding, starting with uh, Kosatu. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, please come, please sorry, come just to interject, just uh, Mr. Kari. Your pigmentation that's irrelevant uh, in the context of what I'm saying. I'm making a more general point. Yes, somebody wants to interrupt. Who is it? Uh, it's Alan here. Uh, Mr. Kusana's uh, question is in the chat line and it's addressed to Kusato. Ah. Okay, yeah. You've seen it. Uh, you're very good on ICT and all that, so you would have seen it, right? Okay. Is C19 around, by the way? Or they, is C19 around, right? They will respond next, yes. Okay. Go ahead, uh, uh, go ahead, please. Sure, sir. No, thanks, Comrade Chair. I think I've got about um, six quick questions. I'll try to be quick. I think to Honorable George, look, our pension fund proposal was trying to help workers who lost income during the lockdown. So we don't want to have a blanket run on the pension scheme, which will be disastrous for, to workers. But it's to cover those workers who have lost wages. It's a simple, allow them to withdraw the equivalent of six months of salary from the pension funds, not a blank check. Mm. Um, that it should be tax-free. It's also done, Honourable George, Honourable Chair, to avoid workers resigning from their work to cash out the full pensions, which would, we, would be the worst of two situations. I think we'll look at Plan B is the very issue that Honourable George raised about expanding the loan options for workers to lend from their pension funds in case that we cannot um, legally do the six-month salary replacement withdrawal. So that loan option is, is an option as a Plan B. Or we just need to check out the legalities of tragedy colleagues. On the issue of working from home, yes, I think we would support as much as possible for workers, um, especially white collar workers, for students, for learners to work and study from home. We think we really need to prioritize the digital economy, spectrum rollout, etc. 
um, that can benefit us as we fight against COVID-19 is congestion on transport, but also chair can help create new digital economy jobs. You would have seen Amazon has pledged to create 3,000 jobs locally. So that is a wave of the future. Um, to Honorable Okam, in fact, we've got three unions in Kosato which organize farm, agricultural and food workers, um, including one which just joined us last month. Um, we are quite worried about it. Um, agriculture is the backbone of our economy. It is the backbone of many rural towns, especially in the Western Cape, Limpopo, etc. And we think we have not done enough as a nation in the last 26 years to really support the strategic sector of the economy. It is the largest employer outside of the state with um, 800,000 workers. So we're really keen to see how can we help grow the economy from providing easier access to, to, to capital, transport, um, export support, access to fertilizer, to training, even other measures to help reduce the cost of running farms because that can help to sustain those farm workers' jobs, like reducing electricity and water costs, insurance, etc. But here we need to really prioritize in land reform the rights of farm workers. They are the most skilled workers, but they're most disenfranchised, disempowered workers who need to be prioritized when it comes to land reform. And I think we also need to see a real buy local campaign because many sectors of agriculture are threatened by subsidized imports being dumped here. To Honorable Njadu around the UAF, um, look, I think we're quite pleased on a macro level that by this morning, over 4 million workers have received over 30 billion rand from the UAF. We're likely to push past 53 billion rand, so we'll exceed the commitment given by the president. Um, there are huge challenges, but I think, Chair, and we've tried to expand even UAF relief to those workers who actually hadn't contributed, and the sort of the contribution issue with the employer. And it is quite shameful, Chair, that the UAF has actually done more to stimulate the economy now than the banks have done, than, the, than other government departments have done. Small business department has only released 100 million rand so far. So those are the kind of you know contradictions. Um, I think Honorable Njaro, I, I struggle to catch him at times because of the bandwidth issue. The wage, the public service wage bill right now is at the Public Service Bargaining Council. It's undergoing arbitration. We're hopeful we will find a, a solution soon. Um, I think also to Honorable Njaro, the 350 rand long-term unemployment, and also to the EFF Honorable Member, it's quite frustrating to us. It's a small amount of money. By the fact that it's been so delayed by SASA, it's just inexcusable. Millions of workers got their hopes up, unemployed persons, and now they're sitting waiting in limbo by a seriously undercapacitated SASA. So government needs to intervene. We would want to see, Chair, as we emerge from this lockdown, to revive that discussion, as the Honorable EFF member saying, about some sort of a universal income grant. What are the options? What are the modalities? What are the amounts? How can it be a sliding scale approach, et cetera? Um, but of course, the issue of funding will be critical, but I think there is a broad societal consensus. Even the Minister of Finance, I think, is in support of that kind of idea. Lastly, Chair, Honorable Skosana asked about the SOEs. Well, we didn't see any plan around the SOEs in the supplementary or the February budget. We're a bit optimistic around ESCOM because we've had extensive engagements with government and business around a compact, which will be announced or signed in the next two weeks. But the other SOEs are all in ICU. They're collapsing, they're retrenching or threatening to retrench thousands of workers. They are burdened to the state and the economy. And we really don't see a plan from Transnet to Metro Rail to SCBC. All we see is workers being thrown, up, thrown under the bus. Um, Comrade Chair, I think in conclusion to Honorable Karim's, Honorable Chair's comments, we would agree 200%. Right now, now is the time for a compromise. Now is the time for a social compact. All of us, be it from government, from labor, from business, must compromise. Um, that is what has informed us around accepting the IMF uh, financial assistance, how we need to reduce our debt trajectory in a sustainable way. It also motivated us to, to intervene in the ESCOM crisis and also motivated us to push UF to release massive amounts of capital into the economy. And I agree, Comrade Chair, that there's not an unlimited source of funding. So I think for us, that's what is critical is reprioritizing the budget, as we've seen now can be done. Government showing the will to deal with corruption, some small tax reform, it's still possible for the wealthy. But I think critically, Comrade Chair, lastly, the only real solution to grow the economy is to get the private sector on board through impact investments. We have to do that. Government on its own will never have enough money and it cannot raise taxes enough. But it means government has to deal with the issue of corruption and wasteful expenditure. Thank you, Comrade Chair. Thank you, Comrade Kosatu. Next is uh, C19, please. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, I think Shaira and Natasha have both left, so I'll just respond to the the um, question that you asked me directly. Um, and this is from our uh, presentation <coughs> as well. Um, so we are here as an autonomous um, subgroup um, with a cash transfer subgroup um, in the C19 People's Coalition. Um, we're, we're a part of the Economic Working Group. Um, so the submission forms a part of the paid grants campaign, which is focused on the just implementation of the promised COVID-19 social relief of distress grants and the building of a broad alliance towards a basic income guarantee for all. Um, the C19 People's Coalition was formed in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, and it's an emerging collective which includes community structures, trade unions, informal workers' organizations, civic social movements, rural groups, national and provincial NGOs across all social sectors, frontline responders such as community health workers and shelters, migrants and refugees organizations, public interest law firms, and faith-based organizations. Over 310 organizations have endorsed the coalition's pro program of action, which commits us to ensuring that South Africa meets the coronavirus crisis in ways that prioritize those who are most vulnerable, who face the pandemic with hunger, weakened immune systems, and poor access to housing, health care, and social safety nets. Thank you. Uh, who's that? Uh, it's uh, uh, the, Mr. Hoffman, right? Okay, Mr. Hoffman, over to you. Thank, thank you, Chair, and uh, th thank you for even-handedly giving all these disparate uh, uh, supplicants uh, an opportunity. I think that you are quite right when you suggest that there is a social explosion on its way in the wake of the, uh, the pandemic. I think that it's going to manifest itself in South Africa in the uh, increase of destitution, hunger, and the eradication of poverty, or extreme poverty, which is UN Sustainable Development Goal number one, is, is going to be delayed by the social explosion to which you refer. I wanted and I meant to draw attention of the committee to the experience in Namibia it is referred to on our website, but the, um, the, the Namibian experience in the town of Ochiviero, uh, some hundred kilometers away from Vintuk, where a basic income grant was given to everybody in the town, is something from which South Africa can learn, and it is something from which we can benefit if we decide that in the post-pandemic world, uh, the the uh, task of finding jobs for everybody is, is is simply impossible and we cannot leave behind those who do not have jobs, especially those who have lost jobs in the uh, as a consequence of the economic impact of the of, of the crisis. Thank, thank you for the opportunity to to address Paul. Thank you for your brevity. Uh, now, the last one is Outer, please. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, and thanks, Honorable Ryder, for the questions. So, on underspending and performance um, and the elimination of programs or expenses that have not really achieved their objectives, you asked that I elaborate. So, I think I'll, I'll just um, confine my response to what we believe this committee can do what Parliament can do. And I think, Chairperson, in general, having observed many of the proceedings, having observed a few budgets come through, that there isn't really significant scrutiny. Um, we believe that these committees have the power, and the Appropriations Committee quite, quite especially, has the power to reject certain spending plans, has the power to recommend very strongly how a certain budget plan should change. And we don't really see when it comes to the budget review and recommendation reports done by specific portfolio committees, how that feeds into the judgment of the finance committees, the appropriations committee, and whether it approves budgets or not. Um, when there is an engagement with those budgets, 
it's quite limited. But let me get to the point. Um, I think this is a very important question. Um, and I think it really underpins the, the principle of zero based budgeting is that we cannot take for granted all the ordinary expenses for departmental budgets for transfers to state owned entities that happen through the departments to local government. These cannot be taken for granted. So besides only capping allocations to those departments and entities that have underspent or overspent, we believe there has to be a very strong focus on performance and whether these spending items really achieve their objectives, whether there is social impact for those expenses. And if there is not, it needs to be questioned. Um, Jefferson, you have been involved with SAA over the past 10 years, and we can all see what's happened there, how much money has been wasted there, to what end. I think that's the kind of question we really need to ask ourselves. State owned enterprises is a critical example of where special appropriations, transfers, guarantees, and simple bailouts have become the norm for entities that only in exceptional circumstances are truly essential, undoubtedly so. For example, ESCOM, where we are happy to know that there are now structural um, changes on the horizon. I do think another example, actually looking at the, the revised fiscal framework we're dealing with now, um, is additional allocations to the departments of police and defense for their additional functions at the moment. Jefferson, the kind of scrutiny that we would suggest at, at this level is to ask, have ordinary expenses to those departments been utilized efficiently and effectively? Um, looking at the Department of Defense, we know that there are many immovable assets that are not being used productively, that are not being used as they were intended to be used, and that this department doesn't necessarily serve an immediate social purpose over the long term. Why should those funds not rather be reprioritized as opposed to being awarded additional allocations getting to local government and civil oversight what about rural municipalities um, people don't have time and patience to participate in in that financial oversight uh, honorable writer that may be true but i think we should really ask ourselves why people are disinterested um, we cannot assume myself coming from a rural municipality in the free state that there is proper capacity in those municipalities, financial expertise to, to ask these kinds of questions to really budget efficiently and effectively and in a reflexive way. I do believe that there are significant resources in the public that are not exploited by the state, by organs of the state. And that's really a question of organizational culture, institutional culture that senior members of political parties like yourselves can really drive this change to say that there should be more consultation with the public. And I'm sure that if there was the perception and the belief and the trust among people that their uh, con consultation, that their inputs could actually have an impact, that they would be willing to do so. And one way that we're looking at doing so is, is really in modernizing public participation. So we've seen that in, in the past, it would be a simple public hearing, um, and that wouldn't necessarily be popularly attended. But as we're operating towards the fourth industrial revolution now, there are new avenues where people can, in the comfort of their own home, um, even using something as simple as USSD, um, SMS technology, really participate on certain questions of budget priorities. We're engaging with National Treasury and the Auditor General's Office on these kinds of initiatives to really see how public participation can be enhanced. And we believe it's something that really needs to happen. And Chair, lastly, um, you just made a few points that wasn't really directed at us, but I think it's worth commenting on. And we very much agree. We, the essence of, of the situation we are in now is that we have much less with, with which we have to do much more. And that obviously demands serious reprioritization and massive trade-offs. And we believe it really demands fundamental changes in the structure of government, in the size of the state, and in the role of the state in society. And we do believe that government needs to play a much more focused role to, to facilitate independent economic growth, um, private sector and civil society driven economic growth rather than state driven economic growth, which just is not sustainable 
in the current fiscal context. Thanks, Chair. I want to say a few things before we part. Uh, Chip, Coach, I forgot to raise this with you, but there's a, a matter I have to raise in fairness to civil society and individuals who are asked to speak before Parliament. Uh, about six, seven weeks ago, Comrade Coach and uh, Chairperson Mashlango will know, uh, Baker Karva from Nambiti, uh, now known as Alfred Duma Municipality in KZN, uh, wrote to us with a whole lot of proposals on how to manage the economy and the finances uh, in the context of COVID-19. He wrote several, I think about six or seven emails to me because I found him and said, OK. Finally, I said to him, look, the best thing is to appear before this committee when we look at the adjustments appropriations, Chairperson. I notified the two committee secretaries, Alan and in Koleleko Mangweni. I told them, let this guy know he's blind and he spends a lot of time following our affairs, so to speak. He might be listening in and I hope he is, uh, and much to my dismay, the committee secretaries, who are excellent otherwise, care coach, you will agree, uh, didn't let him know. And I only yesterday remembered it by accident. I, I came across his name in my email box, I have to say, and I asked them, is this gentleman being invited? And he wasn't. So Nkuleko and myself contacted him. We engaged with him several times over the phone. And finally, he said it's too late for him. He's blind. He's not at work at the moment. He's based in his house. But he will make a submission if he can make it in time by Friday, 12 o'clock. His submission will be taken just like any other written submission. He wasn't ready to make an oral submission today. But we should seek to ensure that the two secretaries, whoever and other secretaries, invite him. Specifically because that's what we promised him. That is his parliament too. So I want to, on behalf of the two committees, because this is a decent thing to do, even if we don't know the situation, to apologize to Mr. Carver and assure him such a thing won't happen again. To C19, I want to spare you the newcomers here. I really, really do regret, Sacha, if you're still here, uh, uh, that we carried ourselves the way we did, but I'm pleading for you to understand this is part of a process. Many of your issues, may I remind uh, you again, you may not understand this because of the technicalities, go to, <coughs> excuse me, go to, uh, the Appropriations Committee, and we'll seek to ensure through Lubabalo and the committee chair there that you are given a second hearing. Let me remind you once again before I hand over to the co-chair uh, that you can come back on Friday from 18.00 to 21.00. And as I hand over to the co-chair, uh, three minutes behind schedule, I would like to plead with my brother there not to be a populist, okay? He's a young lion. Not to make me roar and then he's meek there because he's a bad cop good cop situation, right? So well, I, I manage the time very strictly, and then he's the populist. He allows people to just speak. And then they say, yeah, you just, we don't like it when you chair. But, uh, you know, usually it's the other way around. Older people are more congenial when it comes to this, and younger people say, no, no, you must finish. But let me finally say to those four uh, institutes or organizations that have contributed now, please understand that we will read every line of your submission, Every comma, every full stop between now and Sunday. And the two chairs take overall responsibility before we send out the draft to members. Uh, uh, you know, they will hopefully have read now, especially Comrade Coche, because they're sitting, or we all sitting, most of us at least, in our home bases and a small number actually in Cape Town. Finally, just to draw uh, C19's attention to Mr. Skozana's comment there, and then Dion George, I'm not his spokesperson, he's advertising that he's got a private member's bill on the pensions matter. Over to you, Comrade Co-Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Honorable Karim, for taking care of business uh, from opening until now. Uh, thanks very much, even in the manner that uh, you handled the, the meeting. Uh, let me proceed and not take much of your time because you have to attend the NCOP business. And uh, right away, invite uh, Budget uh, Justice uh, Coalition to make a presentation. Uh, we stick to 10 minutes, as uh, we have done right uh, from the beginning. So, uh, BJC, can you present? Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Uh, my name is Busi Sibeko, and I'm a researcher at the Institute for Economic Justice here representing the Budget Justice Coalition. Um, with me is Daniel McLaren, who will also be presenting with me. 
The Budget Justice Coalition um, is a coalition of organizations which includes one of the most, the largest um, civil based organizations, equal education, civic based organizations called Equal Education. These are our members. We just want to make the submission to contribute to the consideration of how the relief funds um, have fared so far and what measures would help citizens in the economy recover from COVID-19. So far, what we have experienced is that the COVID-19 relief package has not been a properly implemented, which has left many people vulnerable. Um, in addition to this, um, the proposals have planned out in the budget in a different way, and therefore we're seeing that the relief package is not 500 billion as had been promised. Thanks, Percy. This is Daniel, BJC, and from Section 27. Um, so, in the in our submission, we compare the constitutional obligations the state is under in terms of especially realizing socioeconomic rights. And in this period of um, crisis, um, this question of austerity and regression in access to socioeconomic rights, we compared the measures that were announced in the budget, um, in both in February and in the supplementary budget, with the kind of normative standards which our constitutional court, as well as international treaties we've signed up to, sets. Um, for retrogression or regression of socioeconomic rights um, and and sort of see how we, we compared. And the first criteria is whether this austerity which we're implementing through large scale budget cuts now and in terms, first of all, whether it's necessary. And on that question, um, we think that um, alternative financing measures haven't been comprehensively exhausted. These are uh, listed and detailed in our submission um, where the state could find additional revenue to ensure that socioeconomic rights are not, uh, don't, do not have their, their budgets cut. We think that um, compared to other countries, our debt remains manageable. It remains mainly RAND denominated. All countries have experienced an increase in their debt to GDP ratio because of COVID-19. It's a natural consequence when your economy shrinks and your revenue goes down, that your debt to GDP will increase. Our increase has not been uh, more or less than other countries. It's been about average with our peers. And so we don't think that the rising debt to GDP ratio is yet a reason for significant cuts. However, we do um, always make recommendations for where savings could be made in the budget. And we do give some details of those in our submission. Um, we also think that um, the deficit is not our primary problem lack of growth in the economy, the lack of uh, redistribution in our economy, our high levels of inequality, they are what create a constant deficit between our needs as a country and the, the resources which we raise. We, we still have very wealth-friendly tax policies, for example. So we do not think that the regression which we're seeing in access to rights, and we give very um, many examples of where regression is occurring at the moment in our submission, we don't think that those are necessary. Um, they're also not temporary. Government is planning on implementing austerity into the medium term. Um, and we think that poor people will be the most impacted by these budget cuts. And there's also a lack of transparency and opportunities for um, communities to participate in the big decisions which um, are getting made at the moment around these cuts um, for the 2021 MTF. In terms of the relief package, we didn't see much evidence of it in the budget. Um, only 36 billion rand of new additional spending has been allocated this financial year, which is less than 1% of GDP. So as Casata was saying, this is no way near close to a stimulus. Um, we don't see any evidence emerging of a stimulus. Instead, we see this commitment to budget cuts. And we think that these are coming at the wrong time and they're not a proper plan for, for getting our country back onto a growth um, and inclusive, inclusive growth path. The budget was also completely gender blind. There's not a single mention made of women or gender-based violence, despite the president highlighting that in his last televised address. Um, we find that quite shocking. Um, once again, this policy commitment to gender equality is not matched uh, in the budget. I've got an extra slide on health. 
uh, which I'll turn to in a second, but just to point out that only 2.9 billion rand in additional funding is provided to the health sector. And we're asking whether this is enough. Um, as the C19 coalition said, there has been underspending incredibly on the social grants promise. Um, decisions have been made to restrict access to the grants. The Treasury is presenting this as a lack of take up and we, we find that completely disingenuous language that the Treasury is using. It's this difficult administrative criteria which is preventing people from accessing these much, much needed grants. Um, and then in other areas, rather than a relief package, what we're actually seeing is cuts um, to basic education spending, cuts to the HIV age grant, um, cuts to electricity connections when, which people need when they're staying at home, um, cuts to agricultural support, cuts to infrastructure spending. And we don't think that any of this is, is being well thought through. It's just being done within this very strict austerity paradigm, which the Treasury seems to uh, be bent on trapping us into. Um, and we're calling on Parliament to take a stand against austerity. This cycle has been going on for years and we're getting deeper and deeper into a cut, more cuts, less growth, more cuts, less growth scenario. And we think we need a, ch a change of course. Um, just on the health sector, I won't say too much about the grants, which is the next slide, because those have been covered by the C19 coalition. But if we just go back to the health slide, as I said, only 2.9 billion rand in additional new funding. Um, and the provinces are being required to fund the bulk of their COVID-19 expenditures, not just in health, but in other areas like um, housing and education. Um, but staying with health, they're being asked to fund um, almost all of the expenditures from within their existing equitable share allocations. And these have been squeezed already in previous years. So in the health sector, at the onset of this crisis, we had about 40,000 vacancies in the sector, um, including vacancies of nurses, doctors and specialists. This has been a problem for years because of austerity budgeting, it means that the overall budget available to provinces is not commensurate with rising needs in the provinces or commensurate with, with rising wage costs. Um, so without um, changes to, well, we, we, we're going to have a continued ongoing increasing need and without changes to the wage structure, um, we're going to have underfunding when the budget doesn't increase to meet those needs. Um, as a result, we've got provinces where equipment and facilities are in real disrepair. This is at the onset of this crisis, and we're seeing all of the fallout from that now, particularly in provinces with the least available revenue options. So if we look at the Eastern Cape, probably the worst um, financial situation of any health department. Um, annually, they turn over about three billion rand in unpaid bills because they just don't have enough funds. Um, and these provinces are nevertheless being asked in this supplementary budget to fund their COVID-19 expenditures essentially. And we are really concerned about whether they have the ability to do so and the effect that this will have on patients who are presenting in public hospitals with COVID-19. Um, there's some information on the social grants there, which I will not dwell on, but we think that some of the decisions which have been taken around the social grants are highly regressive and irrational. Um, the government's own advisors have uh, made clear that the decision not to give the CSG per child, but to give it per caregiver, the top up, um, would result in 2 million more children experiencing food poverty. So we think decisions like that, again, with, within this austerity paradigm, are totally regressive and irrational. I'll hand back to Percy, thank you. Um, thank you. If we can just move on to the slides on the IMF and revenue. So we've been- Hello, I hope you are aware that you are left with two minutes. Yes, yes, yes. So I just wanted to say that we do not believe that South Africa needs to immediately go to international um, financial institutions to loan money, particularly in foreign denominated debt. Uh, we believe that there are a number of ways in which we can raise revenue internally. This includes annual wealth tax, income increases. I won't go through the whole slide, but as you can see there, we've thought through a number of ways in which the revenue base can be increased. Capital gains, for instance, is another one. If we just move to the next slide. In addition to this, we believe that there's other, um, I can't see the slide, sorry. Okay, so the Securities Transaction Act can, tax can also be raised. Um, we can also 
reform taxation of immovable property um, and that we should further um, clamp down on tax evasion, which we've written extensively about in our submission. And the next slide, please. We've also thought through some other um, ways to raise revenue, which have been uh, spoken about internationally. For instance, solidarity taxation on windfall profits. We do not believe that companies should benefit from the crisis excessively. Um, there should be a solidarity taxation of high incomes, and we should not rely on people to voluntarily um, donate to the solidarity fund. Um, there's a number of other ways, cheap borrowing from the um, PIC. Uh, we've got GEPF and UIF funds and surplus which can be borrowed from in RAND and therefore not in dollar denominated debt. Um, next slide please, I would like to focus on this um, and we think that participation and transparency is very crucial particularly when we are talking about zero-based budgeting um, and if you just go to the next slide I just want to emphasize why we believe that transparency and participation are important. We believe that zero-based budgeting might mean that projects are cut that people need and therefore we are asking for a human rights baseline um, to be um, assessed in terms of budget allocation so that if zero-based budgeting is to be implemented, there should be a baseline for how much we need to be spending on various sectors. Again, we believe that austerity is not working. It's actually stagnating our economy further um, and it is regressing socioeconomic rights. We believe that the relief package should be implemented the way that it was announced um, in various capacities, including the 100 billion, which was um, announced for the job creation and so forth. We believe that there needs to be a fiscal stimulus, which is gender um, sensitive and child sensitive, um, that paves the way for South Africa's growth and that GBV in particular should be taken into account and that we need to expand our fiscal framework or our fiscus um, so that we can deal with these various issues that we've raised through this, um, uh, what do you call it, presentation. In addition to this, we believe that a fiscal stimulus can pave a way for our economy and that we need to consider a Green New Deal by spending more and that we will not um, progress if we do not spend more. In fact, we will only make matters worse and that zero-based budgeting does not resolve the issues that we believe need to be resolved. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Wusi and Daniel from uh, BJC. Uh, let's uh, proceed to the next uh, presentation by uh, Fiscal Cliff Study Group. Over to you, Fiscal Cliff Study Group, Prof. Uh, good morning, uh, Chairperson. Uh, I will make a few introductory remarks, and then Dr. Fani Hubert will continue from there. If we can move to slide three, please. Uh, this really summarizes the situation which South Africa finds it in, in terms of its current fiscal position. Uh, South Africa suffers bureaucratic oversupply and the tax base can no longer support the bureaucracy that's been built in this country. Advocate Paul Hoffman earlier this morning already alluded to bureaucratic oversupply in respect of food control and the resultant food wastage. I also point that the poor taxpayer down here in the corner of my slides, there are only 600,000 individual tax tribute, more than 20% of the government's tax revenue. And I've heard of many ideas already this morning to burden them any, uh, even further. It's only 600,000 individuals contributing more than 20% of this government's revenue. Do we really believe we can tax them any heavier without them leaving the country? And I now hand over to Dr. Fani Hubert to continue, please. Thank you, Prof. Um, yes, so if I can just um, go on where Prof left off. I think important here is um, if we talk about the budget austerity, according to us, uh, there has been no budget austerity, at least in the past 10 fiscal years. Um, for us, this, this technical term means that we would have to see at least a balanced budget. Uh, on the graph there around 2005 to 2007, uh, that was more or less a balanced budget. But what we have seen in the last almost 10 years is an average budget deficit of about 6% of GDP. So actually, we've been running very expansionary budgets. Then, of course, the problem is that this builds up over time. 
um, into the government debt. And as you can see there, we've seen that in, in ex very big spike uh, in the latest uh, supplementary budget. And again, uh, going forward, we are worried that those forecasts could be underestimated even more. Now, if we get to, uh, to nominal GDP, now I'm just going through a few points uh, yeah, because this is important assumptions for our uh, for our model that I'm going to show just now. But uh, so, for example, in 2020, we are actually going to see a decline in nominal GDP, which is quite significant. We don't often see see that. Um, and then also, we can see again the, the real GDP growth forecast going forward. Uh, again, very likely uh, to be over optimistic. Um, and also, for me, a very important figure in this slide is the, the GDP growth figure in 2019, which was 0.2%, again, indicating that even before this crisis, uh, we were, we were he heading uh, into serious troubles as far as growth is concerned. Uh, this point has been made before, but just again, as this is a major input into our model, uh, civil service remuneration, even though the, the figures uh, are lower than the budgeted figures, there is still, they are still rising over time. And as you can see there, based on the 2020 budget, there was an average annual rise of about 3.5% uh, per, per annum. Okay, so to get to the, the fiscal cliff itself, and for those members who don't know, uh, we have done this a few times in the past, but what we look at is, is the point where civil service remuneration, social assistance payments and debt service cost uh, are equal or how much of government revenue does those three uh, expenditure items take up. Um, and as you can see uh, in 2007-2008, uh, this was about roughly, those three expenditure items was roughly uh, half or 55% of tax revenue. Uh, by the February budget this year, that has increased uh, to three quarters of revenue. And uh, I think it should come not as a surprise, but in the latest supplementary budget figures, we have actually gone uh, more than 100% of revenue. So to put this just in a, in a graph so that we can see, I think important firstly, uh, if you look at that yellow line around 2008 to 2012, uh, we see a very sharp pickup from about, so it's the three expenditure items as a percentage of revenue and which increased from about 55% to 70% during that two or three years. And this was what initially has drawn our attention to this whole research that we have been doing. Um, as you will also recall is that during that time, the South African GDP was actually contracting or we were going through a recession. So this for us was a very worrying sign. But still then there you can see the slight uptick in that uh, barometer between the 2020 and, 20 and 19 budgets. Um, and then now, but I, I think important there is it was still not too severely, although it was increasing, it was not too severely. We lost about two years in the scope of that one year as far as when we will hit the cliff. Uh, now, as you will know, <clears throat> the latest figures that we had to feed into the model from the 2020 supplementary budget, major uh, impact, of course, the revenue reduction of almost 300 billion. Uh, then the, the social grant increases of 41 billion. Uh, which according to us was a, a once-off increase. Then of course the, the increase in, in debt in general, about 400 billion, but uh, according to Treasury's calculations, that will only increase the debt service cost of about 7.1 billion. Uh, so we are still not sure exactly how they get to that 7.1 billion given the huge increase in the debt amount, but still this is the figures, we use the actual figures that's in the supplementary budget to feed into the module. And then what you can see is uh, where previously the, the latest uh, forecast was sort of trending upwards. Now it makes that huge spike where basically in this year we are expecting that uh, social assistance, uh, compensation and debt service costs will take up all of our government revenue. Okay, but we don't want to leave it just there. So just a bit of uh, more forecasts uh, going into 2021 and, uh, and beyond. Um, so there you can see all the, the assumptions that, that feeds into uh, the models going forward. Um, I'm not going to run through all of them, but let's just say most of these are based on averages we have seen in the last 10 or so years, or they are based on an inflation plus one percentage point 
going forward. So it is really um, reasonable uh, assumptions going forward. And what we can see there then is that uh, um, the fiscal cliff, even, even though we see that, that large spike that we see this year, we see it pulling back slightly again. But the problem is that we actually see a upward shift in the, the graph itself. So where we were, let's say, between 70 and 80 percent of revenue based on the February budget, we now sort of made this um, jump to where we are likely to be around 90 percent and above uh, going forward. So finally, yeah, if I can just make. Dr. Yes. Joubert, you are left with three minutes. If you can gallop, please. Thank you very much. I'm, I've just got a few recommendations left. Uh, so just uh, as we say, um, we have been uh, predicting this fiscal crisis since, since 2014. I think a very important point I want to add there is that uh, we are looking at sustainability. And for us, that was a big problem that we highlighted. As I mentioned, there between 2008 and 2012, when we saw this big increases, despite the economy not performing, that was a big red light or a warning signal to us. So uh, yes, as we know now, this, this cliff has been reached and um, there has been a, a structural shift uh, given the latest revenue shocks. Um, then we want to make the point again that for the last decade, South Africa have not had any austerity budgets. Um, for us, an austerity budget is one where we are at least aiming uh, for a balanced uh, budget. And then what we also say is that this leaves very little capacity and then also we um, the, the zero based budget approach is highly appreciated and necessary, uh, although uh, we are still left with a lot of uncertain details. So uh, likely the devil is going to be in the details again, but let's see how that process uh, goes forward. Um, then, of course, I'm, I'm not going to talk about uh, state owned enterprises. A lot of other speakers have already alluded to that, um, but obviously, given these constraints, there is very limited room. Uh, for additional support to uh, especially non-functioning uh, and non-essential status and enterprises. Then I think this point is also, uh, we are probably all getting tired of it, but uh, the only uh, way we can really uh, get away from this position if, is if we get a rapid economic uh, growth. Again, I want to make the point that if the South African economy was growing by, let's say, 5%, as we were during the early 2000s, then a lot of this research that we are doing would be, would be not important. But unfortunately, this is the situation that we are in and we need to be uh, looking very carefully at, at where the money goes. Uh, then as a start to, to help with the growth, South Africa should be the investment conduit into this uh, subcontinent. And then I, we also want to again uh, urge members to take the, the minister's warning of the looming uh, sovereign debt crisis uh, with some, some seriousness. Um, and of course, that global uh, lenders' willingness to provide funds uh, should not be confused with South Africa's ability to repay it. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Professor Rousseau and uh, Dr. Joubert for your presentation from Fiscal Cliff Study Group. Uh, the next presentation is uh, from the Economist uh, Initiative, uh, 10 minutes. Excellent. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that honourable members are he he hearing me? Yes, we, we can hear okay. you. Okay. Excellent. Uh, so my name is Gillard Isaacs. I'm the co-director of the Institute for Economic Justice and a lecturer at this university. Um, honourable well, members, thanks very much for the opportunity to uh, present here. Um, I, uh, I'm a representative here now of uh, almost 100 economists, e economic analysts and professionals in r related fields. Uh, the submission e includes uh, 28 professors, uh, a, a, a further 18 PhDs, um, uh, four National Research Foundation chairs, uh, various heads of departments, the ex-statistician general, former members of parliament, 
and other leaders in their fields. Honourable members, we make our submission with some reluctance and a deep sense of trepidation as uh, infections rise, our economy stalls, businesses close, and millions go hungry. Uh, we make our submission because we believe that the supplementary budget before you reneges on the president's 500 billion rand COVID-19 rescue package and poses dire risks for South Africa. Um, uh, we have, have already heard from submissions some of the uh, details here. We have heard that instead of a 500 billion rand, this budget advances 36 billion rand, less than 1% of GDP in new expenditure. This is because of the 145 billion, uh, 109 of that is funded through existing allocations. Uh, we have heard that the changes here are a reduction in social security from 50 billion to 41, that only 6% of the 100 billion rand for job like creation is allocated, that only 2.9 billion in new health spend is allocated, and that only 11 billion in new municipal spend is allocated. As for the uh, terse wage su support scheme, the credit guarantee scheme, and tax re relief measures, all indications are that these have reached only a fraction of businesses in need. Um, you've also heard how th this budget makes cuts to future expenditure, uh, 2.1 billion in long-term school projects, 4.6 in transport infrastructure, almost 10 billion for higher e education, uh, and so on. Uh, you've also heard how there is no allocation here to fight gender-based violence. Um, Chair, under any circumstances, this would be alarming. And yet, the context now, as you are acutely aware, is an unprecedented economic and social crisis. The Chair is correct that no one knows exactly what the future holds uh, with 100% accuracy. But in its same budget, National Treasury shows a contraction of 7.2% of GDP. The IMF shows 8%. Others show far higher. And our estimates show that with a fall in our economy of this size, it places 1.7 million jobs at risk and poses a reduction in wages of 185 billion rand. Honorable members, in these circumstances, countries around the world are taking emergency measures in line with those originally announced by the president in, in his 500 billion rand rescue package. Honorable members, in our submission, we do, do not mince words. We say that this budget reneges on President Ramaphosa's rescue package. The budget undermines uh, our constitutional obligations to progressively advance the rights of all. As you are, are aware, the rescue package is, is aimed at supporting households, small businesses, employers, and, em and employees through this unprecedented hardship. It represents the very best of our, of our policy making. It is a series of measures which brought business, labor, civil society, experts, and others together. It is one which was supported widely. And 
this budget arrogantly and unilaterally moves in the op opposite direction. Hon honorable members, this budget is economic suicide. The National Tre Treasury has failed to provide a reasonable and a rational basis uh, to enact policy which goes against the grain of international consensus and is a violation of our president's announcement. Presumably, this is on a reluctance to allocate the 500 billion rand based on e e increasing debt levels. As a collective of economists, we suggest this is fundamentally misconceived. As the co committee is uh, uh, aware, debt levels are a r ratio of our debt stock to GDP and our tax revenues service this. It is obvious that if our economy tanks, if GDP falls, if revenue falls, uh, and then our relative debt levels rise. Under this budget, debt levels will rise. F failing to take the necessary expenditure now leads to worse, not in improved public health, uh, public finance outcomes, although there is a Freudian slip there, which is true of public health outcomes also. We have heard alternative approaches here, which have been articulated by ex-national treasury officials, leading economists, unionists, business leaders, civil society formations, and other ex experts. This would involve a significant increase in the rescue package expenditure, uh, financed through some combination of solidarity taxation, increased borrowing, mobilizing quasi the public fund, and Reserve Bank action. Uh, Gilad, can you um, round uh, but, the talk up in the next two minutes? Yes, yes. Thank you, Chair. We cannot expect the committee within the timeframes now to adjust the minutia of this budget. And even if we could, the architecture and logic is so fundamentally flawed. This is why, honorable members, our submission makes a call for this committee to take the unprecedented step of rejecting this budget outright. We do not make this call lightly. We do not claim to represent poor uh, workers, small business owners. But as a collective of e e economists, we are frankly terrified what w will happen to these and others within South Africa without an effective rescue package. In rejecting this budget, we are not asking the committee to make new policy. We are asking the honorable members to stand by the policy already announced by our president and supported by many within labor, civil society, and business. Honorable members, this budget asks us to fight this unprecedented virus with both arms tied behind our backs. It has no rational basis in economic theory or in present realities. Th thanks. Thank you very much. Th thanks, Gilad. Um, from uh, Economics uh, Economist Initiative, uh, the next presentation, South African Institute of uh, Accountants, Saika. Uh, 10 minutes, please. Thank you, Honorable Chair um, and Honorable Members. If you're allowing us to speak, I'm going to share my screen with you, Nkugleku, so I think it'll be easier than you don't have to change slides. Um, can you guys see my screen? Still coming? Yes. There we go. All right. Great. Thank you. Well, when we were sitting here in February, uh, we warned that 
South Africa was heading towards an iceberg. Uh, we warned that underneath the iceberg, there were a whole lot of other issues that were coming that hadn't been addressed. Little did we know that one of them would have been, oops, have you got the wrong slides? Let me just share my screen with you. <laughs> Whoops. Oh, there we go. Can you see the correct slides now? Not yet, it's still coming. Okay. Carry on. Okay. Okay. Right. So little did we know underneath that iceberg was one little thing that we didn't anticipate, and that's COVID-19. And that's what's led us to being all being here today. So in light of that, we're going to be discussing the announcements that we have welcomed, and there are quite a few. The concerns, however, are also a lot, and that is our revenue expenditure and debt. And we're going to make certain recommendations in that regard. Now, we do welcome the thinking that came with the large scale relief uh, to those that were most vulnerable to COVID-19 with the stimulus package. We, we are very thankful for that. We do welcome the introduction of zero-based budgeting as a guiding principle. It's a bit late. It should have actually happened earlier. Um, however, we do warn that it's not something that can continue into the foreseeable future due to the time and expertise needed to actually um, implement zero-based budgeting. But it is something that we can use in the meantime. But we do urge National Treasury to go and have a look at New Zealand's zero-based uh, budgeting, uh, where they have a surplus budgeting, which is really interesting. So how it works basically is you get to your baseline expenditure that everybody is happy with, and thereafter you uh, need to work within those means. And if there is a surplus on the budget, then every department would have to apply for a percentage of that surplus, and it would be allocated according to the needs of the particular, uh, whatever needs are, are there at that stage. It's not automatically given. So it's something that could be considered going to the, in the future. We also welcome the tax revenue collection, mainly through the better enforcement. Um, it's going to put relief on those compliant taxpayers that are really at this stage struggling just to stay alive, never mind the compliance and administrative burden that they are facing. If we look at, um, we were happy with taking the active approach. However, we do question what approach was taken before this if we weren't taking the active approach up until now. Uh, if we look at the revenue predictions, and that's where I want to start, is, is that our problem, as, as the Minister mentioned back in 2009, and as we've highlighted in Parliament over the last few years, is that our problem is that we're spending more than we're actually earning. It is as simple as that. And if you look at those graphs on your screen, you will be able to see that from February to now, that spending trend has got even worse. But this trend has been with us for the last 10 years at least. So if you go back to 2009 and 10, we haven't changed our spending patterns at all. Or it's, we have, but they've just gone up. So no austerity there. So we're sitting with a budget deficit now currently at 709 billion rand that we need to bring down to zero and start then making surpluses. Because if we don't, we're gonna, have to, we're gonna land up paying more debt and more interest on debt. So what are our options? As we said, we've got three options, and we've said this before, we either can increase tax revenues, or we can reduce our expenditure, or you can introduce a percentage or both of those, you know, a, a mix of the two. Now, if we look at tax increases, and there's a few recommendations coming through in some of the presentations so far, um, one of them being the wealth taxes, the digital taxes. On the digital taxes, we do just want to warn, um, if you look at the uh, reprisals that France has got from the USA for introducing their uh, digital tax, it's not as simple as, as everybody makes it out to be, but, but the OECD is working on, on those proposals, and we will follow that quite closely. Um, if we look at the expenditure side, uh, that's what we're going to touch on just now, but I just want to focus at this stage on increasing tax revenues. So what the, the forecasts have predicted is that revenue will increase. So tax revenues will be increasing, albeit not as quickly as it used to in the past. Our concern, however, comes in the, the growth estimates, which have, have also been mentioned in a few presentations uh, so far. Um, one of them mentioned 2009, we were sitting at 0.2%, and we're now estimating that that's going to go up to 2.6% next year and 1.5% in 2022. Now, that is quite concerning, considering that uh, the World Bank, Moody's, their projections are nowhere near that. If you look at global, global growth, it's also not. So we, we are really 
very optimistic in, in our present, in our um, estimations. And if we look at the track record of National Treasury in respect of these estimations, that's where our concern comes in. Their track record is not, unfortunately, not that good. In most cases, the over-optimistic approach is not in line with the realistic approach. What's actually happening um, real in the real life scenario is that the revenues are not coming in. So what's the problem if the revenue is coming in? Well, the problem is we're not getting income, but the biggest problem is we're spending based on the income that we thought we would get. And that is leading us into the deficit position. And the same goes for the GDP projections, um, as a few speakers have also mentioned. It's it is meant to go down roughly estimated by 15%, but we predict it could be even more than that. Again, the problem with that is that our expenditure is based on the predictions of this growth. And, and that's not going to happen, meaning once again that we're not going to get out of the expenditure circles that we're in and we are going to have to keep on borrowing more and more money. So our concerns, to put it lightly, are are the GDP and revenue estimations overly optimistic again? Uh, will the active approach really be direct revenue generation focused uh, or will it rather look at indirect revenue uh, focused spending? So it's spending on things that is not going to produce revenue in the future and we need to answer, we need National Treasury to answer these types of questions. On the expenditure side, as we've said, because we are not uh, getting in enough income, we are spending based on the income that we thought we would get. And because we're doing that, we have a budget deficit and we have to borrow money to continue our expenditure spend. And this has been going on for the last 10 years at least, but we have had it under control and we are now putting ourselves back where we were 20 years ago. We started reeling that in but at this stage, we are back to where we were 20 years ago in our debt situation. So for every, as somebody's mentioned before as well, we used to spend 15 cents on every rand of tax revenue that was coming in. Now we are spending 21 cents on every single tax rand that comes in that cannot be used for social spending, education, health, et cetera. So where do we cut it? Well, the minister did promise that we're gonna be cutting about 230 billion rand over the next two years. However, if you look at our expenditure and, and various presenters have brought this out, is that our expenditure, although it might be reducing slightly, is not reducing by near enough. So our expenditure is actually to a certain extent increasing. The only thing we're reducing is the uh, rate at which we are spending. Um, so that might be coming down, but we are still carrying on spending similar to we were in the past. And as we can see, that is unsustainable. So we do in this regard welcome the zero-based budgeting. It's, I think it's definitely something that will assist government in ensuring that only the projects that will provide value for most of the people in this country um, are approved. Everything else we cannot allow to be spent on. Um, yeah, so... That leads me to the municipalities and a few other speakers, or one other speaker I think did bring this up as well, is again, we allocating another 11 billion rand going through to our municipalities who are on the ground and should be helping our people. Yet if we look at the Auditor General's report again, we again have repeated accountability failures in this regard. How can we be giving more money to institutions where they are not delivering on their primary mandate? We have unqualified unqual audit reports coming through left, right and centre. I think only 20 out of the 257 municipalities managed to achieve clean audits. Until we get that right, any additional spending there is not, it, not going to help. And that's where the accountability comes in. And we do welcome the, the uh, suggestion about public participation in, in the municipalities. Can, what are our concerns? Can you round up, yes, Hello, thank you. Run, can you round up in the next I, two and a half minutes, please? Yes, I will. Thank you. So will the minister get the support required? So this is lovely thinking, um, but again, it comes back to action. Is there gonna be action and everybody on board in respect of this action? What does the actual active approach focus on and will it bring down the budget deficits? Will the Auditor General's report actually lead to disciplinaries and accountability for the spending? And does the government pull uh, to do the zero budget budgeting? Is it there? But please consider our alternatives. And as we said, this is only the tip of the iceberg. There's a whole lot of other problems that we've spoken about before. I'm not going to mention them. Um, they've, it's, oops, there we go. We all know what the problems are, but what are we doing about it? And I think that is the next question. My slides seem to be stuck, but I'll carry on in any case. 
So what are our problems? Um, SOEs, the wage debt, debt uh, the wage crisis, um, the unemployment going forward, the education system, our water infrastructure, et cetera. We all know what the problems are. What are our recommendations? Well, if you look at it, we at this stage are really struggling with spending in the right areas and making sure that we have proper spend. Um, crime is out of control. Until we get that under wraps, we're not gonna do anything. Uh, our policy, we need a coherent policy. At this stage, we don't have a coherent policy. We're not all on board. And this is for the first thing, the, the first time that I've actually sat in parliament where I think we're all speaking from the same page. We all, as, as Honorable Karim said earlier this morning, we need to be modest, modest. We need to work together in the spirit of give and take. And as Kusatu said as well, we need private sector intervention here. We cannot rely on government to do this alone. We need economic stimulus, we need economic growth, and we need the private sector involved in this. What is government's role? They have a big role, but it might not necessarily be in that space. Uh, we need to get rid of corruption and wasteful expenditure. Uh, we have some of the worst stats in the world on crime, on education, on policy, uh, currency volatility. We are the worst in the world. We need to change all of that and we need to do it now. Um, and we need to do it together because if we don't, we are going to be sitting with uncoordinated policies and we're going to have a sovereign debt crisis where anything we say is going to mean nothing and we're going to be told what to do. We have the chance to change this. We need the action and we need to see it soon. Thank you. Can you, can you pack it there? We'll engage you Done. when we come to discussions because Thank we have you. your document sent to us. Thanks very much, Sharon. Saika. Thank you. Uh, the next presentation comes from... Uh, Mr. Peter Miakin, you will have to bear with me the pronunciation. Uh, Peter, uh, time is yours now. Hello. Hello, Peter, we can hear you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, you can proceed. You can proceed. You have got uh, 10 minutes by half past, half past 11. You should be done with the presentation. I can't hear that. Um, to speak, to say that again, please. I didn't, I haven't uh, used this before. Okay. And Kululak and uh, Alan, can you assist uh, Peter so that all of us can hear him and he can hear us? Hi, uh, Peter, we can hear you on, on this side. Can you hear us? Okay. All right, well, uh, thanks. I, I, I'll, I'll start then by saying uh, good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here again, and especially to see Mr. Karim, with his undiminished enthusiasm for taxes. But I see again put in as the last speaker. Uh, I must remind you that the last is never the least. As usual, there are a lot of doomsayers here today who have not read or understood the Constitution. Minister Wini, one of those, has forgotten how the Constitution can actually end poverty, end voluntary unemployment, end corrugated on suburbs, and end the state subsidy of interests. Section 229 of the Constitution insists the taxes cannot be told, which materially and unreasonably prejudice national economic policy. Now, ironically, the minister there is this, or in his one-eyed MTPS on page seven in my the documents, he decided that <clears throat> income taxes and that were so efficient that they must be placed by a 100% tax on land rent. Noble economics laureates acknowledged and were signatories to a letter to the president of Russia to adopt that taxes. You can see that on page 10 of my submission. As an aside, the Economic Initiative and the Institute of Chartered Accountants, who presented before me, have no well in their in their submission. The Davis Tax Committee and National Treasury made some feeble administrative reservation to the minister's MTPS. They must have forgotten that uh, Hong Kong and Singapore are amongst the richest nations of capital in the world, 
and rely on land tax. What this change does is transforms our South Africa to a tax haven, where taxes, people tax on the land, not what they do. Here are some examples of inefficiency. The cost of living increases by some 28%. That is 70,000 per each 17 million household. That's it's clear. If you buy something which somebody will sell you for 100 rand and you have to pay 128 rand for it, uh, you, your cost of living goes. Because land is not taxed, except for rates and tax. Land prices become unaffordable, and they are for a state subsidy. This is section 25. Because of this, many landowners do not pay taxes, but advance capital sales and wait for the land prices to increase. In section 24 and 25, and this is in order to clear up the uh, uh, the, 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 the mess in the, in the rusty corrugated socket. The Constitution authorizes the Reserve Bank to print money to fund thousands of houses and flats to rent. Read this section very carefully. It is not a popular interpretation, but it is the law. It also creates many jobs. And it's also not constant defeating which, which money is spread about, and no assets are added the Rosa balance sheet. Once land becomes affordable, the entire, that is, it becomes taxed, the entire 9 million involuntarily unemployed can afford land of a thousand square meter allotment, that is 10 per be fueled, and then intermission, learn to grow fruit and vegetables there for up to 20 families each, earning 12,000 and enjoy those life for their lives. Gated farm villages is a partnership in which, which manages the no tractor bio of allotment villages, where people are offered a permanent fried lifestyle for their life time. When we for another look, no, we virtual meeting with Parliament. This enterprise is being stifled by high land prices. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Peter, for your presentation and uh, all the other presenters. Uh, let's move to discussions. Uh, honorable members, uh, comments, questions on the presentations of uh, uh, BJC, FC, SG, Economist Initiative, Saika, and Peter. Uh, and Alan, you will assist. Uh, in identifying the members who would want to uh, make comments. Uh, I see Honorable Shbambo uh, uh, has indicated us to uh, come ask a question. Honorable Shbambo. No, thanks, uh, Chairperson. I, I, I think... Uh, Look, one admission that you must make broadly is that this process of public hearings are mostly talk shops because they do not translate into any changes of what gets to be presented as budget. So people just come and talk. It's like having a a TV debate, you know, like or just a public discussion because none of the things that are going to be said here, whether valid or not, will be elevated into concrete a consideration by National Treasury, because National Treasury has defined its a program, a neoliberal austerity program, and which is not based on reason. And, and, and whatever you say, even when you give scientific, proper, sound economic argument to illustrate that National Treasury is not basing this based on reason, they still proceed with the, whatever they've announced. So that is one first observation that uh, I want to make. And two, Chair, maybe from your side, one thing which you might need to think about is the demogra demographic profile of people who interact with the budget every time, year on year. That should concern you in terms of why is it that 
majority of the people who come and make submissions do not look like you, and you look like majority of South Africans, it's one of the things that you must have to look into as to what causes that. What are the voices of black people in informal settlements and villages? And how are you going to then uh, elevate those voices to this platform for consideration in terms of what should happen? Uh, and, and, and then, of course, uh, we must look into that. It's, it's not an insignificant issue in South Africa that is defined by the history of racism and racial discrimination in terms of what happens. So you must look into that. But uh, And then, of course, in consideration of the fact that this is a talk shop, I want to hear the Budget Justice Coalition and the Economist Initiative's uh, characterization and thereafter view on the so-called zero-based budgeting. Uh, so those are the only uh, responses that I want to listen to. The rest, uh, it was reactionary uh, drivel, uh, which we cannot entertain. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Honorable Shibambu. Uh, Honorable Matlangu. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, let me take this opportunity also to welcome the presentations. And with your permission, Chair, I'd like to share with my comrade, to comrade Tim Kiva, that uh, Contradesa does not have to wait for the committee to invite them because um, for public participation, we do advertisement and invite people to, uh, uh, for, for, for contributions. So even before then, they can. They, this is their parliament. If they they feel there's something that they want to engage on, let them do so. Uh, so on the on the on the presentation by done by our learned. Uh, 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 colleagues, the economists, I don't remember the name, but I know they are economists. There's just the one thing that I want to I want to reflect. When I I heard the name of the of the of the of the group or of the organization, I was impressed and I listened with the passion and had more expectation. But there's one thing that disappointed me to say they reject this uh, uh, amend, 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 amendment uh, budget. And if they reject, unlike to me, I, 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 I expected them to say they are disappointed, they are not happy with the adjustment. But if they reject at all, and from what you're saying, they are lobbying the, the committee to also reject. How do you expect us to, 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 to deal with these issues that are facing us as a country? Because there is money. And the other thing that we should be careful about is to um, separate the Minister of uh, Treasury and the President. Because there are processes before these things are pronounced. There are processes. There are, there are, there are, there are, there are committees. There are cabinet where the president is sharing his part of it. So we shouldn't we shouldn't at all times try to divide instead of trying to find each other and 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 of course uh, constructively uh, criticize. And come up with the better way of, uh, of of recommendation of saying this is how we think you can best do things. Um, uh, on on the issue of the talk show, uh, I, I, I at some stage I, I shared I used to share the same the same sentiment with Comrade uh, uh, Floyd, but since I've been here in the in the in the, in the in the in the NCOP Select Committee on, on Appropriations, I have realized that uh, we, in this sixth term, we are trying by all means to make sure that we take a uh, point. Hence, we debate our we debate our our, our reports. We take points that uh, are, are making sense. 
as recommendations to the, the, the House. And as a committee also, we make sure that we follow up on those uh, recommendations, uh, whether the department uh, are, have responded or how far are they in terms of responding to that. I think I, I, I did share that at some stage, conveniently so, but uh, to a certain extent now it's starting to change because I'm doing something about it. Thank you, sir. Uh, thanks, Honorable Matlango. Honorable Raida. Thank you very much, Chair. Chair, yes, I want to agree with uh, Honorable Matlango and welcome the presentations and thank the people that have put taken the time to put submissions together and bring them to us uh, and ensure that they all feel comfortable and welcome and, and realize that we appreciate their inputs. Um, it doesn't want it matter what they look like. They are South Africans, um, and we, we welcome their inputs into this process. Um, I, I think that people from all corners of the economy have been represented today. Uh, we've had Kasatu, we've had C19, uh, and, 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 and various others that have all given different aspects and perspectives. Um, I agree with Honorable Mashlangu that... Uh, uh, everyone is welcome to give inputs, and uh, there's no limitation to who is allowed in um, and, and, and who is given opportunity. I think we must also take note that there have been some written submissions, um, people who've chosen not to present to us, um, and I encourage all members to engage with the emails that we've received so that we can all get a good background and a good understanding of exactly what we have here. Um, that really is, is, is a comment in response to, uh, to to earlier comments by by, by members, um, I I particularly enjoyed uh, a lot of the inputs from the submissions. The one that I want to tick on as well um, is this issue around zero based budgeting, and it was raised by by Dr. Joubert and, and and as well by Saika as well. And I think Saika's point was quite an important one to where they said that the skills pool to do zero-based budgeting is, 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 is questioned. And the fact is that I believe that effectively, and, and I've used this phrase before, but the way zero-based budgeting is being left to be done is effectively asking the turkeys to um, plan Christmas dinner. Because what we're trying to do is get departments um, to cut off their own limbs, to 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 sacrifice projects, et cetera, that they've obviously felt is important to date. Um, and 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 the fact that 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 um, we're now asking them to do a little bit of, of self-mutilation uh, for the for the good of the cause, certainly, but um, it's 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 often a very difficult decision for departments to do. And I really think that they may need to be assisted by Treasury. And I'd like to particularly hear from both Dr. Joubert and from Saika about what their proposals are for the best way to approach zero-based budgeting, which I believe is absolutely necessary um, and, 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 and the only real thing that's going to take us forward because we're all in agreement, and, and this is, point has been made several times, we're all in agreement that, that government, the way we, we run government needs to change materially. We need a rethink. So, so you know, I think perhaps the, the, the best way to do that is perhaps what, what is up for debate. So um, thank you, Chair. Those are my inputs. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, so far, I have got comments and questions from Honorable Shbambo, Honorable Matlango, and Honorable Ryder. Uh, can the presenters uh, respond to those uh, questions that have been posed by uh, members? Uh, Ten minutes, please. We'll start. Saika, can you respond? Yes, thank you very much. Happy to respond. Um, to start with the zero-based budgeting question, 100% um, correct. It, it's something that is needed, but you can't do a zero-based budgeting if you don't know what the border-based policy is, where you need to align your budgeting to. And that's our concern is that we don't have a, a, a plan of exactly what we should be spending on and how much we should be spending on these certain items. I mean, even, even if we take the, the health spend now, we're allocating money, but we, we're giving it to municipalities, to uh, provinces, but we're not telling them exactly where it needs to be spent. We're just allocating the money with no detailed plan 
of what we expect that money to be spent on. I'm, I'm going to ask on uh, Peter Faber, who's my colleague from SICA, uh, to explain how the uh, New Zealanders do it, because they've managed to do it really, really well and bring down their, their budget deficits and, and started working with surpluses. Thank you, Sharon. Honourable members, I think the one thing about zero-based budgeting, obviously it's a cost mitigation exercise, but I think within the public sector and government in general, one, you need to mitigate costs, but it can't in perpetuity be the focus of what we do. So we, when once we got spending under control, I think the shortcomings of zero-based budgeting, and there are some shortcomings, even though quite a large grouping of listed entities, et cetera, do adopt it. So what we had proposed in, in our written submission as well on the New Zealand base, where they have called it a zero line, is to take the budget, have zero line increases going forward, and then put together various departments actually making submissions jointly and government coming up and saying what are the priorities and those governments actually, mm -hmm. or those government departments, then actually lobby and present as to why various of those departments actually together have to get a part of those allowances. The other departments who then don't get additional, they obviously have to find those efficiencies. So it does create a balance between, call it cost mitigation and enforcing efficiencies as well as making sure that government is actually focusing its money on the mm -hmm. priorities of its spending. So it does seem to find quite a nice balance between the two concepts rather than being the one or the other. I don't know if that answers uh, Honourable Ryder's question. I think the one question he has are on the skills. I think if we look at the current um, process, takes starts off mid-year, takes more than six months to actually go through it. And obviously, if you have to redo it without any base that you're working off, redoing and re-evaluating just becomes a very time-consuming exercise on the one hand. And on the other hand, you actually do need to then have the skills where everybody is informing that budget at a very level. So you need to have it decentralized to a large extent. And to his question, that is the concern we have because the skills that can't just be centrally within Treasury, those skills will have to lie with the actual departments where the spending priorities, et cetera, need to be identified. So I think on that basis is where we're coming from, from our concerns on both elements. Okay. Uh, thanks, Aika. Fiscal Cliff? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, Dr. Hubert apologizes for the fact that they had to leave. Uh, I will take the questions. Let me start with zero-based budgeting. We agree with the skills problem that Saika has alluded to, but we feel that uh, zero-based budgeting is an opportunity to rethink the whole bureaucratic structure. If you allow me, I will use one example. This is a car license disc. Why is it necessary to renew it every year? Why can a car license disc not be valid for five years? And I'm just picking a period of five years. So in our view, zero-based budgeting is the opportunity to rethink the bureaucratic structure around South Africans, where we have too many bureaucratic rules that must all be applied, thus increasing the cost of the government we have. And in zero-based budgeting, it's also necessary to ask questions whether we indeed need the respective bureaucracies that we pay for. If I can then uh, just uh, turn to the Honourable Sh Honourable Shavambu's remark about this forum running the danger of becoming a talk shop, he's of course indeed right. It's not only this forum, it's Parliament running the danger of becoming a talk shop in as much as parliamentary committees fail in the, in the oversight of the executive of the government. If parliamentary committees fail in such oversight, do not hold the executive accountable, these committees will indeed become talk shops. I will use one example again. Uh, before the uh, elections in 2019, I did a presentation at the previous standing committees. The Honorable Karim will remember this. And I made the argument that cabinet ministers, deputy ministers, all state government departments, all provincial governments should only buy vehicles manufactured in South Africa. No imported vehicles should be purchased. 
It will stimulate our economy by the tune of about 58 billion rands a year, something that can be done overnight. The committees wrote a formal letter to the office of the president, bringing this to his attention, recommending this to the president. And till today, as far as I know, the presidency has not answered that letter. And the Honorable Karim can help me if I'm wrong in saying the presidency has not answered that letter. Now, that is where the Honorable, Sh Honorable Shavambu is right. This is when these committees become talk shops, when they engage the executive or when they call the executive to order and the executive simply ignores these committees. And this is where the executive oversight role of parliament must be improved. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, thanks, uh, Prof. Uh, Economist Initiative, uh, Gilad, two minutes. Excellent. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, to start on zero-based budgeting, I, I mean, I would just note that uh, there's the difference between what it is in reality and what it is in intent in certain instances. In reality, if we are going to start to budget according to actual need, which is the word used so far, then our budget's going to increase, okay, but significantly, because there are massive needs in South Africa, right? So zero-based budgeting is being used as a rhetorical device, as, as a cover, as a process for uh, increasing budget cuts. That's the first point. On the honorable member's comment on re rejection, I I've presented before Parliament now maybe 12 or, or more times and have never been involved in a, in a call which calls for a rejection of a, of a law. Um, but I cannot impress, and so in response, I'd, I'd say two things. The first is I cannot impress upon members enough the scale of the crisis which we're facing here and the extent to which this budget does not address that. Okay, we are facing at least a contraction in our economy of 7%. And, and, and yet we are intervening. We have firepower of a percentage point. Now, th this is not uh, radical economists who are coming from a left field. This is the approach to fiscal stimulus taken by the United States Congressional Budget Office. Right. They say you go big, you go hard, you go early, you target households, target sectors hardest hit. And the international consensus, right, including by like the IMF, the, the World Bank, is to intervene with a commensurate size of what the crisis is. At very best, we have one seventh of that size. Let's leave aside the uh, 230 uh, billion in the credit guarantees and in tax relief schemes, right? Uh, what this 36 billion represents is 15% of what was promised. Now, the honorable member, I'm not sitting here trying to draw some wedge with the President and Finance Minister, I can only look at what's in front of me, right? And in front of me on the one hand is a presidential an, an announcement which says we will do X, Y, Z. And in front of me on the other hand is a budget which allocates money A, B, C. And X, Y, Z and A, B, C are not the same thing. They do not match. They are poles apart. And if we don't implement the type of plan which our president laid out, this economy is in absolute crisis, absolute crisis. And that is the choice before you. And the reason why we say, yeah. and I'll end here, uh, the reason yeah. why we say yeah. is a, a rejection is because that's the only option open to you to say to the minister, this isn't good enough. You go back and you do it again because it's not good enough. It doesn't rescue people, our businesses, and our 
workers in the way which it needs to. Okay. Uh, thanks, Gilad. Uh, Budget uh, Justice Coalition, two minutes. Yeah, I'd just like to add on to the issue of zero-based budgeting. Um, I think that we are concerned about the capacity to implement a zero-based budget that progressively realizes human rights. Because as we've seen in the past, cuts are really um, usually in programs that are, are targeted towards poor people. And what we want to say we know what this zero-based budgeting is supposed to do. It's supposed to cut 230 billion over the next two years. It's supposed to help us get to a surplus. We've already answered the, the problem statement without even, even looking at what really is the issue. What is zero-based budgeting supposed to resolve? Why hasn't nationally, National Treasury resolved these issues before? Why haven't they asked programs to be justified? That's what zero-based budgeting is about. Why are we not doing what we're meant to do? And just to say that zero-based budgeting is not going to solve all our fiscal distress. There are high-performing corrupt programs and zero-based budgeting is not going to be able to sift those out because they deliver, but they deliver at a cost and that cost is going to be borne by people. And I think lastly, just to say that when we cut programs that are targeted at the poor, through zero-based budgeting, what we're doing is we're punishing poor people for their governments at local um, and provincial and national level to deliver. And so the cost, who is bearing the cost of zero-based budgeting? That's really our key concern here and that we need to really dig deep to resolve the issues rather than to start at a solution and build backwards to resolve the issues. Uh, thanks, uh, Wusi. Uh, Peter, two minutes. Then I take uh, Honorable Matlang. Nkulagon Alan, can you hear I, Peter? No, no. Hi, Peter, un unmute your mic. I, I thought everybody agreed with me. I didn't get any questions. <laughs> You're okay. Did you hear me? We can hear you. Do, do you have anything to say in one minute before we move to the next no, I didn't, item? I, I didn't get any questions, but I, I do want to just emphasize that you know, we must look to the Constitution. That tells us what to do. We don't have to worry about any, any other uh, faction, any other, what is it, uh, communism, capitalism, or liberalism, or whatever. The Constitution is what we've got to do. Let's just stop taxing people on the what they do on the land. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Honorable uh, Mazango. Thank you very much for the opportunity and uh, uh, allowing us for second bite on the issue. Uh, well, before, yeah, Honorable Mazango, you will be the last uh, to make uh, comments, then uh, we move towards uh, closure. Yeah, you can okay. proceed. Thank you so much. Chaperson, I think uh, Prof. Uh, uh, Rousseau, I've known him um, for quite some time. He has been making presentation on the same subject that he's raising. And I think in this meeting, myself, I can confirm that myself, uh, Honorable Karim, uh, Honorable Shibambo, I don't know if... Uh, uh, Nox is a. We have heard the same thing. We have engaged on the same thing. And if you have followed uh, Honorable Rousseau, this, the, the, the son by the president, he has responded to these issues that we have. In terms of the issue of uh, the, 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 the purchasing of the, the model of the cars. And that uh, uh, responsibility was given to Minister Mkunu as the Minister of DPSA when they were dealing with or amending the ministerial handbook. They have responded to those issues. And I also want to say to members, members and uh, public reps or, 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 or the public as, as, as a whole, they have a responsibility and they have to feel free because this is, this is their parliament to come and criticize us. But it does not mean that whatever you have presented, if it's not uh, agreed upon, 
then you must be angry and, 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 and see this government as non-cooperative. When you give advice, it's either advice is taken or not. And to, 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 to Comrade Floyd, uh, I think Comrade, you need to ourselves from our own different uh, uh, organization independently. Make sure that we try by all means to encourage our members to participate because over and over, over and over again, we have been uh, 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 emphasizing that uh, public participation is very important. It's about time that government must do, I mean, the program of the, of the, of the government and the decisions of the government must be informed by the needs of the people and not the government deciding what people might need. And, and that can only uh, be done through involving and making sure that there's a public participation. Chairperson, the others you will see when we go to the base, and I want to appreciate the opportunity and, uh, and, and, and say thank you so much for, for the second bite. Uh, thanks, uh, Honorable Masangu, and thank all the members and the presenters. Let me indicate that uh, uh, National Treasury Comrade Chair, sorry, it's yours. Yeah, now you're closing, but uh, I mean, I am entitled to speak as well for my three minutes. Firstly, uh, I just want to respond to uh, the professor from Wits University, uh, from the Fiscal Cliff Group, uh, as the chair of the time, just to alert new members. I, in fact, wrote on behalf of the committee twice. I exchanged with Kharab Konov about five times, the last being in March last year. Uh, I was told that the matter, Professor, is being dealt with by the uh, handbook. I had engaged also with two of the ministers, but they said, you're preaching to the converted. We agree with the committee that cars manufactured or put together here in this country should be used by MECs, but across the three spheres. That process is underway, Professor, but it hasn't gone anywhere near where it should. It remains a fact in my view. We don't all have to agree on this, but uh, my view is that Parliament did not get the necessary cooperation from the presidency that it should. It's quite shameful, actually, that repeated attempts by myself offline and with Karat Konov, the Parliamentary Council of the President, solicit not a written reply to the committee. So while Comrade Dikaledi is right, and more than in the handbook, it's being dealt with uh, outside the handbook. Not so far enough. Uh, I don't think actually the presidency responded to the committee the way it should. Secondly, it's not a, uh, is that on my side? Can people hear me? Yeah. Chairperson, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. There seems oh. to be sound in the background, but we can hear now. you. Proceed, uh, yeah. Chairperson. Yeah, I'm going to round up because we, we're at least 10 minutes ahead of time, so it's not the end of the world. Uh, secondly, uh, in Yeah, response, it's just that he went over his three minutes. No, no, my dear. Sharing uh, <laughs> uh, there's some parts of what I'm saying, uh, Abraham's. Uh, 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 have to do with being a chair. No, no, you're being unfair to me. No one stopped you from speaking. We're 10 minutes ahead. So really pipe down. So secondly, now on the economic initiatives matter, look, we can't reject the budget as such, not in these circumstances, certainly. But I would like to suggest that your suggestion, as indeed the suggestion of many others in this hearing, that there's a discrepancy with what the president has said and what the Treasury has offered is something we need to address from the chair. Uh, it's something that I share, and if the majority agree, this is something we need to take up in our observations and recommendations. I think that's certainly true from my point of view, and the view of many of us in the ANC, I think. Those of us may not agree. Although the president ultimately is responsible for the budget because he chairs the cabinet. Then, even if you look at Boris Johnson, I saw 48 hours ago, they're also going towards a state-led growth path. The president keeps talking about a state-led growth path. We don't see enough of that, certainly. The chairperson, you yourself observed that last week in the Treasury's uh, presentation. So it's not clear to me that the budget sufficiently represents uh, what the presidency said. Then I finally want to say that I myself raised the issue of representativity, maybe from a different set of values and perspectives from Floyd. 
But I also want to take this opportunity to chair person, you wouldn't know this, but Peter Meekin, he's a South African. He's been in the circuit, I think, for over 15 years. He's been very active in the local government committee on property rates. I don't agree with him at all, as he knows. Uh, but uh, it's good that he's here at his age, that he even uses Microsoft Teams better than I may be able to do in younger people. So I want to welcome him. Uh, and finally, Comrade Chair, just a few in-house announcements that you draw on as well. Just to remind participants from civil society, on Friday at 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock in the evening, we carry on with National Treasury responding. By Friday at noon, we need a, a two-thirds page of a, a summary of what you'd like for us to include in the report that you yourself decide before we make our own observations on it. Now, written submissions also came, Comrade Chair, to remember. They have just the same weight as those who make oral presentations, and the, and the staff will be putting together a draft for us to process for the committees to look at on Monday and vote on on Tuesday. But I would suggest, Comrade Chair, that the two committee secretaries, Alan and Inkuleleko, send out a letter to all the people, those who made submissions today and those who have written submissions, to remind them that by 12 o'clock on Friday, we need a half a page or two thirds page summary. And then finally, they must put all of these presentations onto the web Sorry. And uh, thank you very much from my side. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Honorable Karim, for your concluding remarks. Uh, we are at least uh, 10 minutes ahead of our schedule. We made it in time. Thanks to the presenters. Thanks to the members of uh, uh, NA and COP who are members of the two committees, respectively. As uh, Honorable Karim has alluded to, uh, let's meet again uh, on Friday uh, at uh, 18 hours for the response by National Treasury uh, uh, to the public uh, submissions on the 2020 revised uh, fiscal framework uh, uh, budget. Uh, uh, thanks very much. Uh, till we meet again on uh, Friday. Uh, hasta la vista, sea tokoza, ikensile, sea bulela, baya danke, inko. Thank you. Good well, everybody. Thank you, chairpersons. Thank you, colleagues. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, chairpersons. Thank you, Yunus. Thank you, Jojo. Thank you, my comrades.
Mm-hmm. 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 Mm-